I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education for Baltimore County for January 10, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Leslie Weber of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. I ask that you then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is to consider the Agenda. Are there any additions? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I would like to add item M5ARA 218 17 installation of air conditioning at Southwest Academy Middle School to tonight's agenda. In addition, at the request of the Policy Review Committee Chair, I would like to pull item H2, consideration of the proposed deletion of policy 8120 from tonight's agenda. According to the Board of Education Policy 8314, a unanimous consent to add or remove an agenda item must be approved by the board members present. All those in favor signify by raising your hand. It's unanimous. Uh, the agenda stands now as corrected. Mrs. Miller. Speakers have to be turned off. It's it's on. It's on. Yeah, they are. I can hear myself. Yeah. Well, that's, it's a trick. <laughs> Mrs. Miller. And first, I'd like to request that when you ask for changes to the agenda, that you also address that to the board as well as the superintendent. Well, the superintendent's the secretary. The, 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 uh, the uh, motion comes to him, the okay. request. But, but we all could make changes to you the could. agenda. You could, and, and you will. My second request is to add agenda item, um, per my request three weeks ago, the audit of student data records for social security numbers. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor of adding uh, Ms. Miller's request to the agenda, it must be unanimous, please say aye. May I make a No, comment? it's just a vote, no, no need for a comment. Uh, we'll do it by hand vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, it fails for a lack of unanimous vote. I would ask for division. A notation of how the vote was. Very good. All those, all those who voted in favor of that motion, please raise your hand again. Those who voted in favor were Ms. Hen, Mrs. Miller, and Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Next on our agenda is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in uh, this box to my right. The first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight. Of course, if there are fewer than 10 signed up. Everyone speaks. Ms. Pratt. Marion Moore. <coughs> Mary Ellen Pease. Lily Rowe. Dr. Ferrone. Cynthia Boyd. Erica Mock or Mal. Very good. All of those persons will be our speakers when the time comes. Next on our agenda is the chair's report. Very briefly, I want to welcome uh, 2017 to the uh, to our uh, world, and uh, and I look forward to working with the members of the school board during this calendar year. Obviously, the second half of our 2016-2017 year is on our mind immediately. Our board has plenty to do uh, in the coming month or so. Uh, tonight, the proposed operating budget for fiscal year 18 will be introduced. 
Uh, there will be an opportunity for public comment next Tuesday, January 17 at 6.30 p.m. Of course, also, our General Assembly begins its 90-day session tomorrow, and citizens across Maryland will intently observe and participate in that process. In anticipation of the session, many members of this board uh, joined teachers and support staff and attended the TABCO ESPBC legislative breakfast meeting this past Saturday. It was a, a great opportunity, an excellent opportunity for uh, legislators to have conversation with uh, champions of the Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, the teachers, the support staff, this board itself. Um, so those are my comments. Next, Aislinn Brett, Ms. Brett. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, for the students of Baltimore County, I hope everyone's making it through midterms, um, studying hard and still getting a lot of sleep. Um, there are three items I want to briefly touch on um, for my update. First, I'd like to thank Karen Levenstein, the Director of Food and Nutritional Services, for meeting with me. During my visits around the county to talk to students to get some comments about what they think are issues in our school system, again and again I was hearing people want to, to open a dialogue about cafeteria food. Um, she was really available. She uh, made sure that we have avenues of redress for students, and I really appreciate her taking the time to do that. Um, additionally, right before break, Baltimore County Student Council hosted its second quarter General Assembly. Um, the event was a hit. I would just like to briefly um, give a shout out to the BCSC alum for joining us and our fearless leader, Jordan, um, for making sure the event went without a hitch. And finally, um, it's that time of year again. Um, we are beginning our SMOB selection process for next school year. Applications have just been released today, and we'll be hosting our first ever position interest meeting January 19th at 7 at BCPS Studio, BCS TV Studio. Um, we've also updated the process, um, and we'll now be accepting two nominations per school instead of just one, um, which will give more students the ability to apply. Um, so thanks, everybody. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Brett. Uh, next item on our agenda is public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, uh, we refer concerns to the superintendent for follow-up. Uh, while we encourage public, out, uh, public output, public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. Uh, everyone is reminded that inappropriate personal remarks or behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask that you, that you observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see the time has expired. First, uh, we'll ask our advisory groups to speak, and the first speaker is uh, from TABCO, Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. I know she's around. I saw her. Okay, so we'll we'll go forward, and if uh, if we uh, see Ms. Baton in a minute, she can come back. Uh, the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, Megan Stewart Sicking. Megan. Uh oh. Good evening to all of you. Good evening. At your December meeting, my co-chair was here to share our priorities for this school year and to summarize the first two. Tonight, I'm here to talk about the third, which has to do with adult assistance working with our special needs children. Training of adult assistants is a long-standing issue. We know the Office of Special Ed is working right now on basic training for AIDS, and we look forward to learning more about that this year. But the core problem doesn't rest on them. It's that the training and supervision of AIDS must be specific to the child they're working with, so it must take place at the school level. However, that doesn't happen adequately, and we're left knowing that our most needy and most vulnerable students are working with the least trained adults. One example I gave at our meeting with Dr. Dance occurred last spring when I was visiting a pre-K classroom with my husband and a BCPS employee. 
There was a child with an aide obviously dedicated to him, and at one point the child was alone, and his aide was at least six to eight feet behind him, looking everywhere but in the direction of the child, and couldn't actually see what he was doing because she never moved from her chair or tried to look. The child, meanwhile, was mouthing an entire set of plastic toys, and as we watched toy after toy going in and out of his mouth, we were shocked by the fact that it was inappropriate and deserved intervention and really gross, but also the fact that it was very dangerous. The aide never moved or had any idea. The teacher, who had an empty center with no children in it, never moved from her seat to check on anyone. And then while we watched everyone sitting there doing nothing, the aide got out her smartphone and began scrolling through a newsfeed. Once earlier this year, despite repeated warnings about my own child being an eloper, his aide let go of his hand in the parking lot at pickup I drove up to the building to watch my four-year-old bolt like lightning and run across the front of the entire school building, across a side parking lot, and up a small hill and into the athletic fields. I threw my car into park and sprinted after my child and stopped him myself. How lucky that he chose to run into the field instead of into the parking lot. It doesn't take much to know that that situation could have been disastrous. I left these experiences wondering what kind of training is needed for someone to support a child appropriately, and when it comes to training and expectations for AIDS, who is actually accountable and how? Per our priority listed for this year, we want to begin discussing ideas about accountability and how principals, IEP chairs, special educators, and anyone in supervisory roles is actually doing this part of the job and somehow being held accountable for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now invite TABCO's representative, Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Sorry about that. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. First, Happy New Year, and a big thank you to those who were able to attend the legislative breakfast on Saturday morning. The weather was a little dicey, but we were able to have some great conversations. I'm bringing you remarks I will be calling stories from the trenches. I hope you will gain a greater understanding of the pressures our teachers are facing daily. There are lessons to be learned from these stories. Specifically, we hope this translates to changes put in place for our teachers. They need to, to be able to teach and use their expertise to choose what is appropriate for their students' needs. One size does not fit all for our, our students and it should not be that way for our teachers either. The first story tonight is about an elementary school and it is happening at more than one school. The teachers are all being told they must write lengthy, several paragraphs long comments for all students. On the surface, you probably think this is a great idea. In practice, it means extra hours, many extra hours, the teachers need to communicate with parents with whom they already had communications. If those teachers are special area teachers, they're writing hundreds of comments. If they are departmentalized, depending on the school size, they could be writing 80 or 90 comments. What is even worse is the principal then reads all the comments and makes suggestions to teachers to fix or add what he or she feels should be in the comments. This does not happen at the middle and high school levels. Our teachers are professionals. They do not need to have someone treat them as if they were students. Teacher judgment is being undermined. Teachers know which students need lengthy comments and which need just a simple, great job, keep up the good work. Teachers hold conferences, often on their own time with those parents they feel need the opportunity to have a sit-down conference. They are also willing to meet with parents who request conferences, call parents, email parents, and write letters and notes to parents. Teachers do this all year long. We are tired of being treated as less than professionals. No wonder teachers are fleeing this profession. The second story tonight, and look for more at upcoming board meetings, as you know, 
uh, the uh, grading reporting initiative has been problematic at best. We have had concerns and because of our repeated requests, the interim report mandate stating that all students must have interims each quarter was changed back to previous year models where only those students in danger of failing had to have the interims. Teachers could send interims to whoever they saw fit, but it was no longer mandated that everyone receives an interim. Unfortunately, not all principals heeded that change and have continued to insist that all teachers must <coughs> send interims to all students. Like the previous story, this goes back to teacher workload. Again, what about teacher judgment? Again, this is a poor way to show we value teachers as the professionals they are. Teachers deserve better so we can do better for our students. We want to see this. Thank you, Ms. Baden. Our next speaker is tonight's uh, Pledge of Allegiance leader, uh, Leslie Weber of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President Emory Young. At past Board of Education meetings, PTA Council expressed concerns about BCPS's new grading policy. On December 14th, two community meetings addressed changes to the policy, the Central Area Education Advisory Council meeting and a meeting at Hereford High School. At the CAEAC meeting, many unhappy parents described how the policy was neg negatively affecting their children and their family lives. The subject of greatest concerns concern was the redo policy. Parents spoke about large numbers of high school students lining up outside school early in the morning waiting to redo assignments, panicked about their grades as they applied to colleges. Students are also staying after school and giving up lunch for the same reason, and teachers are giving up their free time to facilitate this complicated process. Assignments must be approved for redo by teachers based upon students' proof of practice and new learning. This means that students already loaded down with coursework, homework, jobs, sports, and activities are restudying material while trying to keep up with their current assignments. It's clear that the redo policy is creating a great deal of anxiety and is dramatically increasing the workload of both students students and teachers. There were also significant concerns echoed for elementary schools and middle schools. Based on the comments of these parents, the addendum to the grading and reporting, reporting procedures manual has not allayed students and parents' concerns. Considering the confusion caused by the rushed and inconsistent rollout of the new policy, it was surprising at the CAEAC meeting that the addendum was described not as a change, but as a clarification. It was stated that no further addendums were planned. It was further stated that there's really nothing wrong with the policy, it was just misunderstood. PTA Council is aware that TABCO has called for a survey to be created for teachers and administrators to identify areas of need. With the second pe marking period ending on Friday, we believe a a similar survey is needed for students and parents to offer feedback on how the policy is affecting them. The, student must, the survey must also ask if the addendum has provided needed clarification for students and parents um, and teachers on how grades are calculated and if grading pe practices are now more consistent, equitable, and accurate. This is BCPS's stated goal for revising the policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bill Lawrence from CASE. Mr. Lawrence. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this is Go Green Bay Packers. <laughs> now that the Ravens are out, you've got to have a, have a team. <laughs> All you Pittsburgh folks? No? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Happy New Year. You're uh, safe. <laughs> Happy New Year and congratulations, uh, Mr. Gillis, Ms. Johnson, for your ascension. Uh, also, um, congratulations, uh, Julie, for, for joining us. Good to see a, a, a long time, we won't say older, long time uh, community activist like yourself uh, elevated to the board. Thank you. Uh, well deserved. Congratulations. Um, 
just a couple of side notes. One, the budget is coming out, uh, and before we get too much further down through the budget process, I'd just like to do a commercial for uh, an expansion of the PAR program, which is a collaborative teacher evaluation model between CASE, uh, TEPCO, uh, and the administration that is four years old now uh, and needs a little tweaking and a couple of more positions uh, in a billion and a half dollar budget. Doesn't seem like uh, anything at all, but I just uh, feel an obligation. It has helped you tremendously in terms of the retention and training uh, of new teachers and I think as a program uh, that deserves your attention. Um, based on my own experience and that of administrators and Abby's comments, uh, it is clear that uh, not only parents, not only uh, teachers, not only students, but administrators need more clarification. Uh, if I've got principals who are asking something above and beyond uh, what should be outlined in the, um, in the, uh, in the manual, uh, that's on me uh, and ultimately on uh, central administration and supervisors of those principals. We've got it. Um, this is a very difficult thing to do. Um, grades are the way that kids and parents and others know uh, what learning and how student achievement is moving forward. Uh, so the more clarity uh, that we can have, and I know, you know you're trying to get 18,000 people uh, to do the same thing in the same way. Uh, so by definition, you're not going to be successful. Um, but as we move forward, certainly we can um, attempt to do better. Um, Mr. Gillis mentioned the uh, Saturday's uh, legislative breakfast, which I was uh, also uh, able to attend. Uh, as the journal uh, session moves forward, uh, just a reminder um, of an earlier comment, uh, we will be uh, several uh, different groups will be working on legislation to clarify and modify uh, the bill that establishes the hybrid uh, school board, uh, and we uh, certainly encourage uh, members who can, if you feel appropriate, uh, to be involved in um, the, the tweaking, if you will, uh, of that particular piece of legislation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Our next speaker from the Central Area uh, Education Advisory Council is uh, Lily Rowe. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, I hope you all have a happy new year. I'm here uh, instead of Amy Freeman, who's our chair and couldn't be here because um, there is a, an agenda item to repeal policy 8120 and the stated justification for this is that policy 8120 outlines the statutory duties of the Board of Education. As such, it is merely a restatement of the law and not necessary. The Central Education Advisory Council feels that at times when the law can be difficult to find, interpret, or understand, or requires a, a jurisprudence degree, that um, sometimes restating the law in plain language is a good idea. And since the organizational chart says that parents are the top of the organizational chart for BCPS, Having the duties of the Board of Education stated in plain language lends towards transparency and the ease of <coughs> one to understand what the board's job is regardless of one's education or whether or not English is a person's first language. And I believe that simply because the policy is a restatement of law is not sufficient justification to delete it completely. There has to be something in plain language in board policy that explains the function of the board, the responsibilities of the board, such as this policy. And other uh, surrounding counties, Anne Arundel County, Frederick County, um, Harford County, Howard County, they all have this <coughs> policy. So we're uncertain as to why the decision would be made to simply delete it as opposed to revise it for clarification or make whatever other recommendations might be necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Rowe. Thank you. Our first public comment speaker is Marion Moore. Ms. Moore. Good evening, Good education evening. leaders. Happy New Year. Okay, so I was sitting back here and I was listening to, you know, some of the comments before me and I wanted to uh, continue to focus on the performance management system that I believe is that uh, 
third reader tonight and to integrate some of the things that people have been talking about in terms of um, just teachers' workload and the grading policy and things like that. Okay, so I have a few suggestions. Yes, I noticed too that over the last couple of years, a lot of teachers have been resigning. Well, why is that? It might be too many initiatives going on. They're not able to develop certain skill sets such, such as managing the classroom. Um, and so a suggestion that I have is when Typically, I think a, a teacher, if they had someone that they could talk to before they actually resign after three months on a job, after one year of the job, someone that they could talk to about their concerns or what their weaknesses may be, it would be very effective for them. Because you, 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 you want to prevent, you want to retain them. Uh, they would not have applied for the job if they didn't have some type of connection with that subject or that core subject. So for example, if that teacher is having trouble with managing behavior, then you just like either put them at a free agent status or something like that. I'm, I always make sports analogies, but just think about it. That person will be free to work on an aspect of teaching while they just get themselves together, you got to work on one skill at a time with teaching. There's so many roles that you have to play. <coughs> so that teacher who's at the free agent status could help another teacher in the same department with the grading until they get themselves together with um, managing behavior. They could observe that teacher that they're helping and see how that teacher is managing the class but at the same time, they're able to help with grading. They could create the online quizzes so that the kids can be assessed, the formative assessments really quickly. Um, these free agent teachers could um, also give the feedback that that one teacher cannot do for 30 kids in a timely fashion. So, you know, please try to <laughs> prevent teachers from resigning from their positions and just refocus, uh, figure out ways that you can manage their talent and develop their talent over time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Ms. Moore. Our next speaker is Mary Ellen Pease. Ms. Pease. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name's Mary Ellen Pease, and I'm with ABC Schools, or as you know as Advo Advocates for Baltimore County Schools. <coughs> I'm here tonight to talk about the Senate Bill 1150, which was introduced in the last General Assembly. Um, this supported bill, this, sorry, the Senate Bill 1150 supported, it was designed to develop computer health and safety guidelines for Maryland schools. We supported it last year. We will support it again during this legislative session. The bill is now in its draft form, and it int the intent is to direct the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to create classroom safety guidelines for digital devices. It will protect Maryland students who face known health risks and avoidable injuries because they're required to use these devices every day in school. OSHA has protected workers from many of these same issues since the mid-1990s. The dramatic increase in the digital curriculum delivery in our schools, including initiatives like STAT, must be accompanied by some type of objective health standards to ensure the safe use of these devices. This is especially critical in Baltimore County Public Schools since the STAT program began in elementary school, meaning our youngest learners are affected at their crucial time of development. The Baltimore County School Health, the Baltimore County School Health Council's Health Guidance for the Digital Classroom Work Group, do you get that? <laughs> Reviewed research and recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics and other nationally recognized health advocacy groups about 
the potential health impacts of this digitally transformed classroom. This group, having agreed on potential impacts on the muscular skeletal system, vision problems, sleep, cognitive development, and the social emotional development, um, this group drafted detailed guidelines to protect our students and submitted them in November. Similar objective and professionally developed guidelines are needed for all Maryland students to protect them as well. So Baltimore County School has not yet provided data on how much screen time our students are receiving. The School Health Council and the county's own safety and technology committee have asked for this hard data. We all need hard data. We know this is in our students' best interest. I know that you want to work with us to do that. So could we facilitate that soon to all protect our Thank students? you, Ms. Pease. Our next speaker is Lily Rowe. <coughs> And um, does this move? No. Uh, one of the things that it seemed that concerns me personally, I wanted to expound on this um, 8120 policy deletion, is that it seems reflective of two competing ideas of the function of the Board of Education, which I've heard. One idea seems to illustrate that the board is merely here to support the public school central office or the school system and that it's not really required to do much of anything. Just come in and sign the papers because somewhere in Maryland law there's a legal requirement that Baltimore County is required to have a board but we really don't need one. It's not really required. The board really doesn't do anything. It doesn't serve a function. They're just here because Maryland law says we have to, but Baltimore County doesn't really have any problems. We're just better than that. We don't really need a board. That's one idea. I totally reject that idea, but that's an idea that I have actually heard from some of you in private conversation that this is the board and other former members of the Board of Education who have expressed to me that this is their idea of what the Board of Education does. The other idea is that the law actually means something and that people actually want the Board of Education to exist to provide accountability to the school system and that all of these responsibilities outlined in 8120 are actually really what you're supposed to do. That you actually are supposed to ask the superintendent questions and that he actually is supposed to provide the information you ask for and that it's actually not some kind of political stunt or theater or an expression of ill will or all of the other things that I've heard at various board meetings. And I think that until all of you come to a common agreement as to the function of the board, it would be dangerous to delete this policy. Because even with the policy, you don't all agree about what the Board of Education is supposed to do. And that is why there is friction on the Board of Education and why some of you request information and don't get it. And some of you discuss things about each other on social media and you argue about things in the middle of board meetings and news media are having a heyday with this. It's because of you. It's because you don't have a common vision and understanding for what the Board of Education is and what you're supposed to do. And truly, I feel sorry for Dr. Dance because without a board with a common vision to support him, it must be very difficult to know where his boundaries lie. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferrone. Good evening to all and Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, may I take six minutes, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> All right, I would like to add, I would like to add to the value of the board. And here's my idea. It's really for the Board of Education to consider a way of evaluating itself. So my rationale is, is that your responsibilities relate to the budget and um, facilities and something else, forgot what it is. It's really based on Comar and United States Code, which as Lily has mentioned, it's complex and voluminous. So what I thought is that each member would be evaluated from January 1st until the end of the year based on five criteria. And I'm going to volunteer to do that because <laughs> I'm independent. I, I have no political aspirations. Um, and I invite really others to join me in that. So what I propose is to make a scale from zero to five. And I'll give you an example. If a board member sits quiet, doesn't ask anything or ask superficial things, then that's a zero or maybe one, all right? If a board member is really well prepared and comes in energetic, trying to reach across the aisle, so to speak, try to make a consensus, then that's a five. Um, the, the, the value also beside that is really the contribution that board member really would do, not just really in attendance. Fulfilling promises we have seen that with the AIS, you know, air conditioners, for example, repairing schools, new schools. Uh, board members, when they come in at the beginning of the year, need to speak up about what they are planning to accomplish in the following 12 months. And then by the end of the year, we all need to celebrate those who fulfill their promises. And even if they fail, but if they really made a good effort to reach that goal, then that's really all what we ask for. Other value is to answer the community. Answer them through talking in the board or answer them by email. Last but not least, evaluate board members on decorum. I think it's really important for board members to be collegial, to be positive, and if disagree, not to be disagreeable. I ask the community to join me in that. I really like to do it. I send you email with highlights, and I probably will tweak it as I go. <laughs> and I hope nobody, nobody will be bad for doing that. But honestly, you spend so much effort. I think it really behooves you to be celebrated if you really fully accomplish what you need to accomplish or what you should accomplish. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Our next speaker is Cynthia Boyd. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I'm here tonight as a parent of multiple children in BCPS, and I'm also a physician. On November 22nd, a member of the Board of Education said that he didn't want to hear any more comments from parents or others about screen time. I'm speaking tonight to express my concern that a member of the Board of Education would ever say they didn't want to hear from parents anymore, especially about a health issue. There may be many unanswered questions about how much screen time and what type of activity is safe and healthy for children at specific ages for educational purposes. However, health guidance from professionals does not in any way support the idea that time does not matter or that there are not issues to consider. I'm glad that the Board of Education members visit schools. However, a Board of Education's member member's visit to a school does not negate or supersede what is being experienced by a parent, by a child, and observed by parents. You may not always agree with everything said here during public comment or everything emailed to you, but to state that you're not interested in community or parental feedback about a health issue of all things, that is concerning to me both as a parent and a physician. I understand that you are all volunteers and that there are only so many hours in a day. I need to find a few more myself. However, a good faith consistent effort to listen to parents is part of the responsibility of the Board of Education, all members. 
Going forward, I hope the BOE will make every effort to listen to concerns from parents and that the BOE and BCPS will go further and actively seek out input from parents about health issues. I don't mean surveys that hamstring our ability to say anything meaningful or complex. I mean substantive real input. I'll close by saying that I do believe sincerely there is a role for technology in schools. As you think about the budget for next year, remember that the most valuable tool and resource that we have in BCPS are people, our teachers and all the humans that support them in educating and caring for our children. There are no health concerns whatsoever about smaller class sizes, more social workers, more behavioral interventionists, more reading specialists, for example. In fact, just the opposite. The human connection is the most important thing for learning and well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Erica Ma. Good evening. Good evening. Like, med like many other advocates, such as Cynthia, I was disappointed in Mr. Yulefeller's comment at the November 22nd BOE meeting that he didn't want to hear any more comments about screen time. This was based on his observations during American Education Week. In his own words, four hours during American Education Week. I'm thrilled that many of you were able to spend time during American Edu Education Week to see the best of the best in BCPS. But with all due respect for those teachers and students, don't be mistaken that those hours during American Education Week counts as a typical school day. When you consider that each student spends 30 hours a week in school, four hours is not even 15% of a student's typical week. Add that up over a year, and what you saw was a tiny picture of a student's classroom experience. So sorry, you will indeed continue to hear concerns about screen time and the inefficient use of devices in classrooms, in particular in elementary schools. Because there are so many of us who have spent more than four hours in school seeing how well devices don't, and do, work in the classroom. Technology is needed in the schools, absolutely. I'm not asking to throw out the STAT program. What I am asking, and what I've been asking for the past two years, is that the implementation include better training and direction for students and teachers. I will beg of you again. Teach them how to type so that students are not hunting and pecking and wasting instructional and learning time, shortening their thoughts and answers because they type too slowly. Give guidance to the volume that students should use headsets so they are not set to 100. And yes, 100 is the max. And yes, I've seen children using 100 on their headsets. Please give guidance on screen time because some of us parents really do limit it at home and they're indeed getting more in school than at home. And because screens do affect a child's vision and increase dopamine levels like a drug, please limit their screen time so that they can have time to interact with each other and with teachers. Give guidance on how to sit and where to position the computer so students have good posture and are not hurting their backs and neck. And please realize that first graders are still learning the difference between lowercase and uppercase letters and can't efficiently enter in their usernames and passwords. And do first graders really, really need devices? Please include in the curriculum lessons that teach children how and where to save their documents so that they are not wasting valuable time searching and searching for work they've already done and then wasting more time having to redo them. Create online assessments that are accessible to students and parents so that students can actually learn from their mistakes rather than forcing teachers to have one-on-one -on -one conferences with everyone. And when there's a county-wide assessment online, make sure the system is able to handle the traffic so students are not sitting there waiting for the circle to keep on turning and turning. These are not things I have made up. These are all things I have seen in schools and what I promise you is many more than four hours of volunteering, substituting, parenting, and teaching. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Ma. Uh, the next item on our agenda is item H, uh, third reader of a policy, and uh, for that I ask Ms. Williams, the chair of the PRC. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the board, Dr. Dance, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendations to amend board policy 3170 which is presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit H. The committee considered comments received during public comment at the board's December 6, 2016 meeting and no additional comments from the public were received uh, on this policy. Staff is available should board members have any questions. And um, just for the sake of the public, uh, 8120 was removed from tonight's agenda. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation? 
All right, thank you, Mr. Yulefelder. Uh, comment? I would like to make a motion to amend uh, policy 317 as presented to the board. I would like to add to um, paragraph 23 where it states monitors performance and reports on the progress of the school system in achieving its goal. Uh, to add the words to the board semi-annually, we had received public comment from uh, Dr. Ferron um, <coughs> suggesting that and it, it has been an issue in receiving reports in, and it, I think it would be very helpful to make it clear um, that it is important that the board understands how the performance of all of the operations are taking place. Is second. there a second on that motion? Second. There's a second. Any discussion on the um, motion to amend paragraph Roman numeral 2, 3? I have some discussion. Mr. Stewart. So I, I think that that concept is implied, but to the extent that it's not, I would prefer the language at least semi-annually as opposed to creating an requirement that is uh, phrased in your, in your way. I would accept that change to my amendment. Mrs. Miller, do you accept that? Yes. All right, now the matter that is before us is a motion to amend uh, the PRC's recommendation on 3170 to amend paragraph Roman numeral 23 to add the words at least semi-annually. Any further discussion? Question. Ms. Johnson. Currently, how often are we being, uh, is this progress being monitored or is it a presentation to the board? Good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you, Adam. Currently, the uh, paragraph and point in question and, talk, and talking of the uh, reporting the progress is the performance report on Blueprint 2.0, um, is the outward report. That report is presented to the board in June and was presented, um, was on the agenda for last June, but as I recall, the hour got late and um, there was a decision made to defer that report at that time. So there's an annual report. Um, the performance management processes are management processes, and so there are internal updates that are presented to the superintendent and his cabinet. Um, performance management, just for those that may not be familiar, covers both our schools and our offices. Um, I know we talked about that in PRC, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Um, and so there is an annual report that comes to the board at the end of the year. And, um, you know, in my estimation, the, adult, the other reports that the board receives, like an update on the budget, an update on transportation, the transportation is covered in the blueprint. Those are also more interim reports on our progress. Very good. Ms. Williams, was this matter discussed at PRC? Um, we did discuss it. And let me, I'm just interested in your um, assessment of the um, request to do that. Uh, in looking at um, the strategic plan and the performance report reports on the strategic plan, many of those measures are not measures that can be, they can be reported on semi-annually, but the way we've defined them, we would have to redefine those and bring those to the board for consideration in order to um, report those semi-annually. Some of them can't be. For example, our graduation rate is one of our academic metrics. We can't report on that semi-annually. It's an annual measure. And most of the metrics in there are annual measures. Um, many of them lag, but we do, within the performance management framework, have offices and schools looking at leading measures that are more interim and reporting up through their supervisory chains. That was my recollection. I don't. Very good. Uh, Mr. Stewart. So I, I would just, maybe you could comment on this idea, which is that as we stand up performance metrics, including the metrics or the management system being discussed here, that type of system is only effective in as much as we have timely analysis and responses to it. Now, I understand that the administration is taking, obviously, the laboring or in that, but that's why I agree with Ms. Causey's motion, is that we should be a little more informed than perhaps just annually, and so that would be my comment, but also to the extent you have any comments on that. No, absolutely. I, um, we, the, the performance management system is set on a cycle of quarterly progress monitoring for schools and offices. Um, I would defer to the board's vote if that needs to come to you on a more frequent basis. That information is certainly information that the community superintendents and the superintendent's cabinet monitor in terms of school performance, that the superintendent's cabinet monitors in terms of office and department performance. I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I understand. All right. Seeing no more hands. All in favor of the amendment to 
uh, the PRC motion uh, to add the words at least uh, semi-annually, um, please raise your hand. The motion uh, to amend carries. Now we have the amended motion. No, there's no need. It, it, it carried. Um, uh, policy 3170's amended motion now. Mrs. Miller. We're, we're talking about the main motion, correct? The amended motion, yes, ma'am. The amend, right, okay. Um, I had submitted a question um, several weeks ago about the elimination of the ISO standard requirement. I did not get an answer on that. Is there um, any explanation on what is the rationale for eliminating that clause under paragraph 2A3? I should probably provide you some historical context, Mrs. Miller. Um, in 2009, the quality management system was adopted by the system first implemented. Um, the system at the time chose the ISO 9000 standards. 9, they have lots of groups of standards. The 9000 standards are their standards on quality management. Um, the quality management system was very narrow in its scope and its focus. At the time that it ceased, it only covered <laughs> three offices and 12 processes. And so when the board adopted Blueprint 2.0 in 2013, that uh, the strategic plan called for a system-wide approach to, per to performance management. Um, and those two ideas are completely in sync. They're, um, the idea of plan, do, check, act lives within both of those. And the performance management system that we've been standing up over the past three years allows us to have both accountability on the central office side and on the school side. And so one of the rationales was that the quality management system was very narrow in its focus and did not touch as much of the school system as the, perfor the performance management system has touched. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe I'm not understanding, but why would we need to not then be um, having to, re to uh, comply with the ISO standard? Are you saying that that standard is insufficient given that we've expanded to countywide? Uh, no, it's not that that standard is insufficient. It's that the way the quality management system was set up, it was narrow in its focus. We could certainly have kept the ISO certification um, that does require um, internal audits, external audits, and there is cost associated with that above and beyond normal staff time for work that staff would have to do in monitoring the progress. So again, the two ideas are not at odds. Um, the decision was made in June to let our ISO certification lapse. ISO is not something that you see in education and schools, and although Solace Point also had that certification, my understanding is they've also allowed that certification to lapse. And so was there any rationale for not renewing that? I, in all honesty, I was not a part of that meeting, um, that um, top management meeting around the quality management process. My understanding is that there was the belief that because we had the performance management system, we were um, implementing that. We were in each year making sure that all of our schools have school progress plans, and each year making sure that additional offices and departments are um, having scorecards where they're monitoring their process, that we were doing um, things in alignment with the ISO standards and creating quality management within the system. Um, I think one of the benefits of the performance management system is it allows each individual officer department with their particular expertise to use standards that are aligned with their job functions. So there are standards around fiscal management, there are standards around transportation, and so instead of having a single set of standards that we try to apply for everyone, we have a framework around um, understanding challenges, monitoring your data, making adjustments, seeking to improve, that then people can bring the standards that apply to their job functions within that. So I think it's um, the idea of loose coupling, where there's boundary, but then people have some agency within it to improve themselves. I think that's a benefit. But Mr. There Birch. Would. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just ask you, I uh, took a moment to read the analysis that was provided to both the Policy Review Committee and which was made available to each and every board member. Um, as testified to today, uh, the analysis is pretty straightforward. This older system, which might have been a Pinto-type system, is being replaced by a much uh, more robust system that is performance driven and following up on your comments it actually says improve how individuals departments and schools support the goals of the school system and increase student achievement now 
I see you nodding. That's indicating affirmance with the staff's recommendation for going from a less robust system to a more robust system that is performance focused. Is Absolutely. that correct? Yes, sir. As it reads in the policy analysis previously made available to members of the policy committee and to each and every board member and also present on this board doc's agenda. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, last part. There's also Mr. that Birch. designated savings because the ISO mandated the expenditure of thousands of dollars. Isn't that also correct? That is correct. And while going with our own performance-driven system now, we won't be expending those funds. Not external funds, no, just normal staff time. Thank you ever so much. Mrs. Hen. Thank you. Um, is there a more suitable organization such as ISO that offers external audits, and will the system be using those services? So um, the audits connected to the ISO were, in, were required in order for us to maintain certification. So it was a way for us to prove that we were adhering to the standards and that we were following those processes. Um, the current belief is that that's a supervisory task to make sure, you know, it's my job as an office head to make sure that my office and my teams are following the processes of performance management of continuous improvement. And so instead of an externally imposed um, effort, it's more of building agency, empowering staff. Um, as Mr. Virch said, it is designed eventually to touch employees, so there's alignment between employee job, employee job descriptions and what we do every day and performance, and I think we've always thought about that on the school side very explicitly and the work that teachers and principals do to put forth and um, increase educational opportunity and success for students, and we're also now doing that on the central office side in the same way. So to your knowledge, there is no organization that would provide that service, knowledge, and no. that's not best practice. That was a long-winded answer, a long way to say no, sorry. <laughs> before, before we uh, ask Mrs. Miller for the last question on this, anyone else have a question? Mrs. Causey. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adams, for all of your helpful commentary. Um, I would just ask a, a question, and then I have a comment. Um, the cost analysis says $9,000 each once every three years. So is the total cost $9,000 once every three years, or were there the $9,000 applying to different departments? There, um, so there were, there, every three years there was an audit that cost us $9,000, and then between those years there was the audit that cost $6,000. So we're talking a little bit less than four or $5,000 a year on average to have a industry standard no, no, no. Mm -mm. it was actually nine, five, 21, 15, six, twenty-one thousand dollars every three years. Seven thousand. So about seven thousand dollars a year in order to have a industry standard, external organization, give um, credence and accountability to our internal controls. To three offices is three one offices. of the things that we would stress. Which three? Is it was, um, ooh, thank you for that question. I do have that in my notes. So I know I wouldn't remember it off the top of my head. Um, human resources purchasing and IT. However, not all processes within human resources, not all processes within purchasing, not all processes within um, technology. Very good, Mrs. Miller. Um, just to make sure I understand this. So what it's, what's being replaced here is we're saying that we are defining our own standards. Um, that can be um, more individualized per department instead of the using the ISO standard. Is so the correct? the um, revision to the policy is to basically put in writing what we're actually doing. Um, so we have implemented a performance management system. Um, it continues, I believe, to, and I don't say that because I sit on top of it, but I believe that it's improving every year. We've gone over the three years from 29 scorecards, for example, on the central office side. Currently, we have 55, and we're monitoring close to 300 goals on the central office side. On the school side, we have 175 schools. Each school can have three goals, three key actions under each goal. So we're monitoring a lot at the moment. And so this was an effort to bring policy into alignment with actual practice in the system. Right, but I'm just referring to this clause about um, you know where we eliminate the ISO standards. So under implementation, um, A2, so 2A2, it says what we're adding is defines standards 
for operational and academic performance. And we have eliminated then the, the paragraph underneath of number three that refers to the ISO standard. So it appears to me that we are eliminating the requirements of the ISO standard and instead defining our own standards. Uh, so that isn't actually correct, and that is because there isn't enough context in here. Um, the way ISO works is they have standards around what you have to do. You have to monitor your data. You need to um, report out on it, things like that. They do not tell you how you drive your processes and what your steps need to be in order for your improvement. So it is not that um, we are we've always been holding ourselves to our own standards. For example, there are standards to, for curriculum development, there's standards for school progress plan development and implementation, there's standards for how you raise up a CTE program in a high school. And so we've always had standards that we followed and our continuous improvement framework and our performance management system allow for people to align to those standards based on their individual job function or responsibility. All right, we've had good discussion on 3170 as amended. It's time to call the, the vote. I, I wanted to comment on one thing. If, if you've ever seen an ISO audit, it, it is only an audit to see that you are adhering to your own standards and processes. They don't give you recommendations. And so the, the point is, is it really necessary for a school system uh, to spend money to have someone else or some other outside agency look at and say, yes, you are adhering to your own processes. And if, if you are not adhering to all the processes, they don't explain to you what you have to change or what you have to do. But Dr. Adams said it's much broader, and I think we get a much better uh, picture of, of how well we are operating in conforming with our own standards and processes. So Let me ask policy, you, 31, I, policy 3170 as amended is now on the floor for a vote. Um, all of those in favor of 3170 as amended, please raise your hands. Can you clarify what do you mean as amended? As amended by Ms. Causey's motion as adjusted by Mr. Stewart, paragraph Roman numeral 2A3, adding, I believe, at least semi-annually. To the board, at least semi-annually. Correct. All right, everyone clear with the, the motion? All in favor, please raise your hands. Opposed? All right, it, uh, there's two opposed, and, and that was Ms. Miller and Ms. Causey. I'd like to stay why I'm opposing it is because I feel that the conversation has been truncated. Okay. okay. I, I second that, and I also think I was going to say that I don't think $7,000 a year is that much of an expense to have an external uh, organization that is nationally recognized, ISO, to help ensure that we are uh, doing well adhering to our own policies. Very good. Next, next on our agenda is item I, uh, consideration of the FY18 capital budget, and I ask Mr. Saris to come forward. So we have the uh, exhibit discussed uh, at our last meeting um, for adoption by the board. Very good. Do I have a motion to adopt the FY18 county capital budget request? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Birch. Thank you very much. Um, George, um, good evening. How are you today? Good, thanks. Good. Uh, I did want to ask you a question. I took a look back here, and this is the uh, exhibit that uh, I think we're, we're at issue on with regard to the FY 2018. Correct. Correct. What I wanted to ask you is, as I went down it, and believe me, I think this is an extraordinarily generous uh, capital budget for our sixth district, and it's also a generous budget for um, a lot of other schools throughout our county, and there'll be a lot of our students and our staff that will benefit to the extent we're able to implement uh, the priority projects listed here. I did want to ask you about a, another school that just happens to be in the sixth district, and I was there just uh, yesterday. Uh, I was there with the state senator from the district who often goes to Red House Run Elementary School, that's the school I wanted to ask you about. Uh, last year, the county executive indicated that the school um, um, had um, received his uh, approval for an annex to be placed on that building. 
And I wanted, I think that that might have been uh, for like FY uh, perhaps 19. And as I look across this exhibit, the exhibit goes from uh, state funding FY 2017, total state funding request, state funding request FY 2018, state funding request FY 2019. And what I wanted to ask you about is where, if anywhere, in the queue is the annex for Red, Red House Run Elementary School that the county executive has indicated he's supportive of? I'm going to have to ask Mr. Dixit. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. Address that question. Mm. The budget that you have in front of you is for fiscal 2018. Uh, all of the other projects beyond 2018, we are in continuous conversation with county and no decisions have been made. Well, certainly no decisions in writing for the FY18 capital budget, right? All of the decisions in 2018 mm -hmm. are included in this uh, matrix that you have. Mm -hmm. But anything beyond that, we are still reviewing different options. And these projects are adjusted based on enrollment projections and the needs of the infrastructure of the system. And the fact that any given budget that a county executive may express approval of um, that doesn't appear here does not necessarily mean that it's not a project that will go forward. It doesn't forward. mean that it will not be included, mm -hmm. but it also doesn't mean that it will be included. It also, it only means that no final decision has been made. For incorporation in the FY18 capital budget. That's, that's correct. Very good. Thank you very much. Other questions? This is Causey. Good evening again, gentlemen. Thank you uh, for the time that we spent earlier in the Building and Contracts Committee meeting. Uh, I, in that committee meeting and related to this uh, county capital budget, uh, we did not address my fifth request provided in writing, uh, fifth request over, uh, so we meet twice a month, so we're going back sometime now to please provide an update on Lansdowne High School geotechnical study. In August, the original presentation of schematics to the board indicated results were based on only two months of study where industry standards are to study a site and a facility for six months. This is related to the uh, chronic and uh, systemic stability um, settling issues uh, with Lansdowne High School. Mr. Dixit and the engineer at that meeting said the geotechnical study would continue. At the December 20th, 2016 Building and Contracts Committee meeting, staff agreed to discuss an update to the board at this January 10, 2017 meeting. So is there an update to the board on the geotechnical study? Mrs. Causey, I understand there's going to be an update uh, from either the architect or the engineer at the January 24 meeting. At the January 24 meeting. So we're supposed to vote today on the county capital budget request by priority order, which has on it a Lansdowne High School renovation that's based on an incomplete geotechnical study with schematics designed on a geotechnical study that's incomplete with bids being gathered on a schematic design on a geotechnical study that's incomplete. But we're supposed to vote today uh, and we'll be getting an update at the next meeting. Is that what I'm to understand? That's, that's, uh, I know that there's going to be an update on January 24. The rest of that I don't agree with. Okay. Well, I will be voting no on this county capital budget request. Uh, I have been asking, as I said, this is my fifth request in writing, and it is unacceptable to me as a board member that we make requests to try and make the best decisions that we can with the taxpayers' dollars to provide the most effective and equitable education for our students. And time and again, these uh, county capital budget requests and the state capital requ um, requests have changed. They, we have not been given answers to questions. Uh, Delaney High School has serious concerns about its renovation, not addressing all of the uh, issues that were brought up. And uh, so I'm going to be voting no on this. At some point, the system, supported by the superintendent, supported by the county staff, needs to provide to the Board of Education uh, the information that we need to make the best decisions. We're not here as uh, 
was suggested earlier by Ms. Rowe, to just say, yes, we are tasked, we are sworn to uphold the law, and the law requires us to make votes for a reason. We are required to make votes because we have analyzed what is best for our students and how can we make decisions when we are chronically not given information in a timely fashion. So I will be voting no. Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, agree with Ms. Causey's objections. I believe further that it is the role of the chairman to facilitate um, getting in uh, critical information such as this to the board. I have a couple of questions, um, one regarding Patapsco High School. Um, my understanding is that this renovation is not uh, including any addition to deal with the overcrowding. They have a large number of trailers on that location, is that correct? Well, all of the work that is going to be included in renovation is posted on the website and we have been extremely transparent about it. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part of answer. The second part is that the discussion on enrollment projections in the secondary school area, that discussions are still taking place. There is no final decision that have been made on that. So that means, I'm sorry, that means that you're not seeing yet that there's the need for it or it could what that means is that point? we don't exactly know where the <laughs> enrollment projections are, what would be the consequences of that. That discussion is ongoing. That's a separate decision and it's not part of this renovation. So if they get this renovation with no expansion, <laughs> uh, would they be able to get one or are they then locked in and have to wait another 15 years before any expansion would be possible? The decision on that part will be made once we know what, what is needed. And at this time, we don't know what's needed. But there are rules governing that. So yes. we wouldn't get the state funding, right, for 15 years if they get this expansion now? No, this is a limited renovation from the huh. state definition, even though county has, uh, uh, has given a lot more than limited renovation chair. So it will not stop us from making any additions to the building. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Stewart. So I had a question about process, which is if in the, after the presentation um, that happens in two weeks, we as a board, and that presentation I understand is going to come back with a cost estimate as relates to the renovation itself, right? So after we hear about the cost of that particular renovation and we have a discussion as a board, are we able to adjust uh, what we're voting on tonight as far as the recommendation or the request that we make within our capital budget? Well, depending on what that option would be, if the option is for building a new school, right. then we'll have to submit it as a new project. It would, it would be submitted as a new project, but we're able to amend what we're doing tonight as it relates to Lansdowne High. The new project can, it cannot be replaced in lieu of a renovation project, so it will be a separate project that will be submitted next year and not in fiscal 18. But that wouldn't make any sense because then there would be a renovation on the books as well as a new school. That's right? why. Well, so I, if the, if I think the answer is likely that the renovation would not go forward if there was a right. decision to build a new school. Yes. Well, I, I would too, yeah. which is what I'm trying but to these are, understand you know, these are, more practically. Yeah. These are not our dollars, these are county and state dollars and um, they're not going to spend them on a limited renovation if there's a determination to build a new school. Right, so my question as a matter of process would be, is it worth breaking out the Lansdowne High piece from what we're voting on tonight I don't, I don't, until we have full information? I don't think so. I think that this is a this is a process that requires delivery of this information to uh, the county to, co to continue its process. This is the county's capital budget. Ms. Ms. Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there a reason, can you just tell us why we did not get that information by tonight? The that schematic. information, as the chair indicated, will be presented at the I, next that's board That's not what week. I asked. I said, why didn't we get it tonight? Because the design is still in the final stages, and the, and the, and the information we present to you will not be complete unless we get to the final stages of the design. What we want to present to you is complete information once it is totally completed. And we are still on our time schedule on the design part of it. 
Uh, I mean, I just want to say, just for the record, it would have been nice, it would have been helpful, it would have been the right thing for us to have had that information tonight if, in fact, we were required to vote tonight. If Dr. the vote is delayed, what happens? So to, to Mr. Dixit's point, to sort of piggyback off him a little bit, um, we did just get the information. And a matter of fact, the completed is not even back in to us. But we did say to take the design uh, to the very end. However, I don't anticipate anything coming back to the board on the 24th that would change your vote of what we're asking you to vote on tonight. Um, we have gotten word that we believe that everything with the geotechnical study would still support a renovation at Lansdowne High School. That's very helpful information. Thank you. But the other thing, Mr. Sh I'm sorry. No, go ahead. The other thing, Mr. Superintendent, it is this idea that the cost estimate would be different than what we're voting on tonight, that what they come back with is actually different than what's proposed here. So to Mr. Stewart's point, I think this is what all four of the high school projects, and I think the county executive has gone publicly, and I have as well, that when the bids come back, I think there may be conversations that need to have around all projects. However, right now, we do have program dollars to support renovations for all four. Again, when bids come back, uh, you know, mid-February, end of February, if a further conversation needs to be held, we're not going to spend money on a renovation if a decision has been made to do something different. And so we expect those bids to come back in mid-February? Is all four of the schools are on different timelines, but between the February and March timeline, all four bids will be back. Ms. Eaton. Will there be any adverse effects if we postpone voting on the capital budget um, this week and vote on it next, next time once we get the reports? Um, it really needs to go to the next step, which is the county planning board uh, based on the established timelines. And I'm expected to be in front of the county planning board within the next two weeks to defend what the board is adopting tonight or we're asking the board to adopt tonight. So the answer to our Ms. question. Johnson. Ms. Johnson. So if, if this comes back for, because I know Woodlawn's had some, some similar, I'm not, not Woodlawn, I'm sorry, Delaney's had some similar discussions. If the geotechnical audit comes back and we need additional funds for the limited, to, and keep it a limited renovation, we then can go to the county, because I understand this is county dollars, and ask the county for additional funds for the limited renovation. If it, that's my first question, question mark. Well, uh, there are two questions in there. The limited renovation funds are already available. County has already made a commitment to that. Okay. So this is not the maximum amount for the limited renovation funds if we need to increase that. If we, if we vote yes today and we need to increase it, <coughs> increase that after the, the audits come back. Yeah. County has agreed to fund these projects okay. if we want to proceed with limited renovation, w depending on what the bits is going to be. Yeah. And uh, I personally would like to express my gratitude to county folks for coming out and open and, and, and committing those funds. The second question has to do with the Lansdown study. If we had any doubts about that, we wouldn't be coming to you. We do not have the complete study and complete document for your presentation, but there is nothing that we know of, and I, I, I shared that in one of the previous meetings, that there is nothing that we know of that cannot be corrected that geotechnical or the structural engineer has indicated to us, and we'll make the complete presentation in the next meeting. I appreciate Mr. Mr. Excuse me. I, I, he, he, oh, he Mr. Yulfader had his hand raised. Thank you. Um, if you remember, the uh, county executive allocated a hundred, um, I think it's a hundred million dollars for this project for, for renovation to the four schools. Um, it is my understanding that um, based on how the bids come back will be a determination. If you notice that the hundred thousand is divided pretty much equally amongst the four high schools, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you can uh, do their limited renovation uh, for the exact same amount in each school. Each school will divide, de determine the, by what has to be done. So my point is that if, if in fact, the um, bids come back substantially higher, uh, we then have the task of going back to the county uh, who has uh, who has come out and said that these schools will receive limited renovation and ask them for more money uh, based on the fact that the bids came back higher. Uh, I, we're not committing uh, budgeted money in the operations of the system for these limited renovations. All capital funds and, and projects, even to which you referred to, Mr. Birch, really emanate 
uh, from the county executive's office. And so um, it, it's our responsibility to make sure that the money that is allocated is spent wisely, uh, accomplishes uh, what we need at this time, and if we need more money, then we have the responsibility of convincing the county in order to go ahead, you need X amount of dollars. This is Causey. Thank you. Just last meeting, we had to approve an addition to uh, a construction project over $100,000 because there were unforeseen complications in the soil. So just as those things happen, and it was stated at that meeting by Mr. Ufelder that it was not missed by our staff. It was not missed by the numerous contractors involved in that construction process. It was unforeseen. So it is my position that there are things that can be unforeseen in this geotechnical study, and I think it is not prudent to vote this forward because I would like to understand what the process is when the bids come back at a certain uh, value, what determination actually gets done. It, the, does the board lose control once you vote for this? Um, so if someone can explain that process. But there are things that are unforeseen that have happened in construction projects. We saw it just recently and had to approve considerable amounts of money. So things do happen. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Well, I think it's been made clear by Mr. Dixit that we don't lose control of the money if, if changes are made. Um, and it is our role to not just say yes to everything. I completely understand. I think this has been a very good discussion, but it's also our role to move the county forward, that we have a budget in front of us with um, with, with the opportunity to, to put air conditioning, limited, limited renovations, and kitchen equipment, um, fuel tank replacement. It is our responsibility to move this county forward. And we have been told that we can make adjustments after we vote yes to this at the next meeting. So I implore every uh, our, my fellow school board members to move the county forward. Um, as we we are responsible to do as as diligent school board members. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Uh, we can make adjustments to it before voting yes, um, which I think is the wiser way, uh, the process to go through. Um, so my understanding is then um, Dr. Dan sta stated that he had the information. That that's, could be that's, that's not what I said. That's what he said. Yeah. I said we've not received the final information yet. However, in talks that Mr. Dixon and his staff have had with the structural engineer and the firm that's doing design work for us, that we do not believe there's anything that would stop us from moving forward with the renovation at Lansdowne High School. Now, let me be, I, I want to make sure the board understands this, though. We've worked very collaboratively for the last over 12 months um, with the county on county capital projects. Mm -hmm. So the money that we have programmed here, even though there are, there are budgeted dollars that we have for every project, they will fluctuate as we're going through the process, working with the IAC, working with the Board of Public Works. However, these are projects that we've come to agreement with the county, matching our enrollment projections. And honestly, looking at the county capital budget right now, there's a lot of money that we've actually asked the county for, and they have stepped up to the plate to give us for deferred maintenance projects. So I want us to be very careful of, of saying we want to move some stuff around and projects actually don't happen because we've actually worked in collaboration with the county who's fort funded us not just county dollars but also state dollars to handle some of these projects as well. And these projects that we're asking you to vote on tonight are projects that have already matched the state capital budget request that you've already approved. So in two weeks, I'm going to be in front of the county planning board defending some of these projects, all of these projects, and less than two weeks, I'm going to be in the Board of Public Works doing the same exact thing. And if the board's not unified behind me with those projects, I do believe that it's going to put Baltimore County in jeopardy in terms of getting some of those funds. So let me ask a question then. So if we uh, delayed for one week, that would not interfere with that process then? There yes, is paperwork yes, that will. we have to get to the county planning board, and there's information we have to get to the county. And I, I want to commend Keith Dorsey, the director of budget for the county, Joy Schaefer's here who works with us hand-in-hand -hand with the county budget. Um, there are things that we have to do in place that starts with the board voting tonight that allows us to move forward with the county planning board. Right. Are Mr. you Stewart. saying we could not get that done if we delayed for a week? I think there would be some substantial consequences if we don't. My recommendation to the board would be to approve this budget tonight. Mr. Well, Stewart. 
So just a, as a matter of process, I understand what the superintendent is saying. I do think it's important that we move forward, but I don't want this board to be in a situation where because of the votes that we've had to take as a matter of process to continue to push forward a bunch of projects that as we get new information two weeks from now, middle of February, March, that we have hamstrung ourselves and boxed ourselves into having to support something that we as a board don't support and can't get behind. And so we do need to still remain objective and have a say, understanding that we don't have tax and authority or an ability to finance these projects out of our own pocket. It is the county and the state. We get that. But we also have a responsibility to make a determination. That's why these things are getting presented to us in the first instance. And so I just want to make sure that we still reserve that right as well. Very good. It's uh, time to, uh, to vote on this matter. Um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, opposed. There's two opposed, Ms. Miller and Ms. Causey. And of course, Ms. Bratt, Ms. Bratt does not vote on this matter. Very good, thank you. The next item on our agenda is item J, personnel matters. And I invite Dr. Mayo forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice evening, Chairwoman Mayo. Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, certificate appointments, and area education advisory council appointments. Do I have a motion to approve uh, the personnel matters uh, J1 through 6? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. There is. Um, Mr. Birch. There was a notice today in the Baltimore Sun papers about a uh, retired Baltimore County librarian. We may use the term media specialist uh, in the current times, but after 21 years of service, this person had retired. She had been a um, a librarian at Parkville Elementary School. She had retired from Hampton Elementary School in uh, 1982. She was very fond of Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers mysteries. Uh, her name is Mary uh, Reinheimer, and uh, we miss her and are grateful for her service. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Birch. Mr. Can Mr. Yulfeld. Can I comment on the uh, graph that... Um, you may. Okay. Um, contrary to, to a lot of what we hear about teacher resignation, uh, I note, uh, John, that in the graph that you gave us, there were a total of 97 teacher resignations. Uh, for the so far for this year and uh, if I eliminate personal illness and um, moving that leads to about 74 teacher resignations for a variety of the other reasons which is certainly much less than 1% of our total 9,000 teachers so if anyone gets the idea that we're having a mass exodus of teachers from our system I, I think that these numbers uh, say otherwise thank you John Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, the motion and the second is on items uh, J1 through 6. All in favor, please raise your hands. It carries unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, item K. And for that, I ask Dr. Dance to go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Supervisor of Language Arts in the Office of English and Language Arts, Assistant Principal at Subbrook Magnet Middle School, Fiscal Supervisor 3 in the Office of Purchasing, and Pupil Personnel Worker in the Office of Student Support Services. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, I would like to introduce one new person to Team BCPS and to congratulate three people on their promotion within the organization. First is for the Supervisor of Secondary Language Arts in the Office of English Language Arts, and currently right now, a Supervisor of English and World Languages for Carroll County Public Schools, that's Ms. Janetta Jamin. <laughs> Janetta, welcome to the team. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? You can stand up. Come on, Megan, you're not shy. <laughs> <laughs> Nora Murray from the Office of Communications and We'll ask all three of them to stand up. <laughs> Megan's not shy. 
Welcome to the team today. Next is for the position of assistant principal at Subbrook Magnet Middle School. Currently right now a secondary reading teacher at Whitlawn Middle School. That's Ms. Kimberly Morrison. Kimberly, congratulations. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Thank you. I do. I have my parents and foster Perfect. You all can stand so we can recognize you. Congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, Kimberly. Next is for the Fiscal Supervisor 3 position in the Office of Purchasing. Currently right now, Purchasing Agent 2 for the same office. That's Ms. Anita Randall. Anita, other than a smiling Melanie, any other family or friends you have with you tonight? He just goes by Randall. There you go, Randall. Congratulations, Randall. <laughs> And last but not least, a people personnel work in the Office of Student Support Services. Currently right now, school counselor for Perry Hall High School. That's Mr. Jesse Wasmer. <laughs> Jesse, do you have any family or friends with you tonight? Elizabeth, you can stand. Congratulations to you. Congratulations, Jesse. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Next on our agenda is um, uh, item L, uh, actions taken in closed session, and I invite uh, Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. <clears throat> Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, this matter was considered on the record as there was no request made for an oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action taken by the Board uh, in that matter, which was uh, hearing examiner number 17-26. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Is there a second? second. There's a motion and a second. All in uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nussbaum. you. The order's on the desk. Very Thank good. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda, item M, is new business contract awards. And for that, I invite uh, Mr. McDaniels to take the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gillis, members of the board. The board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items M1 through M5 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. I have a motion to approve items M1 through M5. So moved. No second is needed. Uh, any discussion? Mrs. Causey. I would like to separate out the performance management contract modification. And that is item three. Uh, all right, so uh, I'll first, entertain, uh, first uh, entertain a vote on items M1, 2, 4, and 5. Any discussion on them? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, M1, 2, 4, 4 and 5. Uh, pass. Now, M3, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the... Um, earlier building and contracts committee meeting. We, uh, the staff did take time to answer questions that were uh, put forward in, in advance. Uh, the questions were answered verbally, not in writing, even though we've asked the chair to ask the uh, staff to provide answers in writing. So it does make it a bit complicated uh, when we have these very large contracts and are given answers uh, just one hour ahead of when the whole board is supposed to vote on them. So I would like to say that although I have a lot of things that uh, are beneficial, have noted that are beneficial in this contract, um, I'm going to be voting no to it because it is as described a creative procurement project where we are using uh, energy performance savings in order to do capital construction uh, items, but, and they've included central air conditioning in these projects, but we are going to essentially have a mortgage, which is a 20-year payback. Um, that is not the traditional way that we fund our capital projects. And I'm not sure why these two schools have been slated to be funded in this creative procurement project in this fashion, as opposed to other schools that have been done in the traditional way. Um, I don't think it's prudent for the board to um, approve these contracts that are 20 years in length uh, that will potentially uh, hamstring 
future boards. Also, these projects are not being handled in their construction in the normal way that our other uh, capital construction improvements are done. And I apologize for the um, hesitancy in some of my comments because, as I said, we had several questions that were submitted in advance, but the answers were given to us verbally. Um, one of the questions that was not asked in the, in the previous thing but has come up is how will the state look at the projects that are funded, the central air conditioning projects that are funded in this fashion in terms of receiving the state share of funding? Uh, we have done similar projects with the state before. This is the third time we are doing this. Uh, this is an acceptable procurement method from state. They are aware of it, and it will not affect <coughs> any of the state funding. We are uh, eligible for all the state funds that we'll receive for these projects, regardless of what method we use. I'd also like to add that state law has been specifically crafted yes. to uh, exempt this type of financing from a local government's uh, bonded indebtedness to encourage this type of financing. And I don't believe I ever used the word creative, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. And I will, I will remind Mrs. Causey and others uh, on the board that just at our last meeting, we approved a, uh, a parallel energy performance contract for the east side. This is the contract that's parallels for the west side. Any other questions? Mrs. Miller. Yes, um, and just as I, I had reservations last month about that one, I also have reservations about this one, so I will be voting against this one as well. Mr. Yulfelder. Uh, I'd like to remind the board and the public that uh, the, this uh, method of financing is at no risk to the county, no risk to the school system, and we are not mm -hmm. having a mortgage, uh, we are not indebted. Um, so the, it, this is a no-brainer by using some assets that we have in order to finance construction or air conditioning at other schools. I, I don't know why anybody could possibly be opposed to a no-risk contract where we can only endure the benefits and whether it takes 20 years for, the per, for Johnson Controls to recoup their money should be of no concern or bother to the future boards or this board. We are not at risk for one penny under this contract. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Before you cut me off, one of the other things that I was going to say is that I had also asked for information that was not provided, which is the, in the other contract, there were 78 schools that are supposed to be receiving upgrades. In this one, there are 78, but the facilities are not named and their upgrades are not defined, and the uh, estimate of which schools get which upgrades first is not defined. And as we all know, there have been inequities in uh, construction dollars spread around the county, and that is one thing that I would like to know in advance of making a, uh, a contract with 59000 and then this one, which was modified to be 44, excuse me, 44 million, and the other one was uh, 59 million. So again, it's a matter of principle that there are massive decisions being made without general information being provided to the board to make sure, again, that we are providing an equitable learning environment to all of our students. Mrs. Johnson. And, and, and there is a 20-year obligation, a payment obligation. Not ours. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. I, uh, last, board, last board meeting, I shared Mr. Virch's, I shared Mr. Virch's excitement about being able to get air conditioning in some of his schools, the schools in his district. And this meeting, I um, hope that everybody shares my excitement in being able to get some of these projects on the west side completed as well. And by voting for this contract, we will be moving these forward principal or not, you know, without, I, I, I agree, I think we need to have a, a list of itemized um, schools and, and, and priority, but we don't have that right now. And, but we do have in front of us a contract that we can vote for and we can move forward, move the county forward um, and get some of these schools taken care of. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, the last word, Mr. Virch, before we call Thank the you, vote Mr. on Chairman. M3. I, uh, I wanted uh, Ms. Johnson to know that I do share mm. her uh, excitement about this matter. I'm sorry that not all board members did that the last time we had an energy performance opportunity to do to save money, do something for our schools. I noted uh, the objection last time. Uh, there was one nay vote, but the other vote was an abstention. It was a non-position taken. So uh, however one proceeds now, that's their own choice. But I'm excited about it, that we're moving forward, that we're not looking back, and we're helping our students and our staff. All right. The question is on uh, M3. All in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? There are two in opposition. The uh, M3 passes. Very good. The next item on our agenda is item N, the FY18 operating budget introduction. And for that, I uh, ask Dr. Dance to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, I said it earlier, but I do want to uh, take an opportunity, first and foremost, to thank uh, Keith Dorsey and Joy Schaefer from our county, um, our county partners, um, for working with us, not just through this budget, but uh, budgets from prior years as well, because the budget process is a year-long process. I want to say a special thank you to uh, George Saris with Tate for putting up with me um, as we go throughout uh, the budget process, particularly over the last uh, three months as we fine-tune it with departments. And last but not least, definitely Kevin Smith, our Chief Administrative and Operations Officer, as we put this uh, proposed budget together for the board. Um, my proposed budget every year is one of the most important tasks uh, that I lay out for the board because it sets the priorities uh, for the school system and where we uh, definitely want to go um, on the administrative side in collaboration with the board. But the budget process is not a superintendent-driven process, and I, I want to especially call out uh, two groups of individuals. First, our area advisory councils for working with us this year, um, very, very much in detail with the budget process. We had several meetings with area advisory council members who gave us suggestions on not just the operating side, but also on the capital side in terms of how we move our, our school system forward, and what are some of the proposed recommendations as we enter fiscal year 18, which is the 2017-2018 school year. But another uh, piece of data that we looked at this year was information from our 20, 2016 Stakeholder Satisfaction Survey. And the public might remember we had over 73,000 responses to that survey that basically said nearly 90 percent believe that the school system was rated effective. And so with that, we wanted to make sure that we kept our process very much focused on our strategic plan, adopted in 2013, led by a strong theory of action that talks about preparing our students to be globally competitive graduates. And so the budget process for this year does align very well with prior budgets and looking at our theory of action that was adopted by the Board of Education in 2013, which at the heart of it talks about our core values and talking about learning being our core purpose, but that our, our organization is really built and driven around the building the capacity of people. With 83% of our budget going to people with salaries and benefits, we want to make sure that we focus on our people while building a culture that is that of Team BCPS. But also, if you think about our strategic plan, it's very much focused on equity, it's giving people the appropriate supports of what they need, not just on our student side from our nine, over 9,000 classrooms, but really looking at our employees as well, too, and to the best of our ability, giving our employees what they need to appropriately support them in the work that they're doing. So over the five budget proposals that we've laid out to our Board of Education, it's important to know that over the last five years, we've really invested in people. As our enrollment has, been, uh, has grown, we've invested over 546 school based positions that really supports teaching and learning in our classrooms. We've looked at large schools and making sure we're supporting them on the administrative side, but also on the counseling side. And we've also looked at how we might increase operational support with our maintenance and our transportation and safety staffs as well. In addition, I was very excited that we were able to add one full-time social worker to every single high school within the five budget proposals that we put forward over the last uh, five fiscal years. As we look at raising the bar and closing gaps um, over the last five fiscal years, it's important to know that Baltimore County did not adopt new standards. The state of Maryland adopted new standards, which required Baltimore County to actually work with our teachers and revise our curriculum to make sure that we had a curriculum that supported those new standards. But we looked at our flex flexible scheduling for students, making sure there were opportunities to take classes on weekends, at night, throughout the summer. I was very excited that we expanded our pre-K opportunities over the last five years to where we have over 3,400 students who are supported in pre-K efforts in our school system. And these are students who are not supported by state dollars. These are all county dollars that supports our pre-K program. 
We also, over the last two years, looked at piloting a full-day program at Sandy Plains Elementary School and Halstead Academy to look at those appropriate supports for students who need a full-day pre-K opportunity as opposed to a half-day opportunity. So we've added nearly 37 positions on the ESOL and the special education side to support our growing student populations. And we have nearly 5,700 students participate in our passport program, which allows our students beginning as early as fourth grade to begin learning Spanish instruction. But first and foremost, it's all about our people. And so every single budget proposal I put forward to our board over the last five fiscal years has really focused on our employee compensation. So um, to dispel a rumor, STAT has not driven the Baltimore County Public Schools budget. We've put nearly $160 million into employee salaries and benefits. So I'll say that one more time. STAT has not contributed to growing budgets in Baltimore County. We've focused on our people. And this is working with our county government, is working with our bargaining units to make sure that we support our, our, our teachers and our employees through cost of living adjustments and supporting those pay scales that we've already negotiated. And with that, it's important to remind people in Baltimore County that you're getting a good return on your dollars when you invest in the education in Baltimore County. Um, with our residents, with our students, we are, are excited that we have 23 Maryland Blue Ribbon schools um, within our portfolio, and we have 20 national um, Blue Ribbon schools. If you think about all of our high schools, and not every single system can talk about this, particularly large systems, um, over half of our high schools are rated among the top 7% of high schools across our country. Our graduate graduation rate continues to increase, but at the same time we're focusing on eliminating gaps um, between student groups as well too. And this board focusing on equity made sure we gave every single student the opportunity to take the SAT during the day that's paid for by the school system. So we are excited that the graduation gap, again, it continues to rise, but it also looks at in, uh, eliminating the gap that exists between um, student groups as well too as they graduate prepared for a college and career level opportunity. And we think about the MAP, the measures of academic progress assessment we give our students in grades one through eight every single year. Over the last school year, we're seeing our students grow at, at or above the national rate with their peers who take the MAP assessment. And so with that, we have to look at who we are as a school system and the diversity that unites us as a school system because our diversity continues to grow, our uniqueness continues to grow, and Baltimore County continues uh, to represent the world when you look at our student demographics and our student enrollment. Um, if you look at our student enrollment right now, African American and white students are our largest student group populations. However, we have a growing Hispanic Latino population and a growing population of multiracial families and students. So with that, it's also important to look at that we have growing student needs. And so I have to keep in mind and remind people that if you think about our students who qualify for free reduced lunch, the statistic that we have, and it's a little less than 50%, it's more students that are enrolled in DC public schools combined. And so the more opportunities we can do in terms of academic supports, but emotional, social, and emotional supports for our students is important when we have our students who are living in poverty. Our English learner population continues to grow, where we have over 5,000 students right now who are English learners. And I'll talk about that in a little bit in terms of the supports that we put in place over the last five fiscal years and what we're recommending to this board for FY18. And the most startling statistic that we have to remind folks is that we do have a growing homeless population within Baltimore County, uh, where we have over 2,400 students right now who are identified as homeless students. And I always tell people that number definitely is a bit higher. These are the students who we know because they've actually filed through the federal McKinney-Vento Act to stay in their home school. So we do have a growing student enrollment. Our student enrollment actually drives our budget um, every single year, drives our classroom and so forth. And so we always think about the fact that when you have a growing student enrollment, it says that families are excited. They like what's happening within the school system. There's a lot of residential development that's happening in Baltimore County. And with this, we want to make sure we're providing supports for every single student within our school system because our projected enrollment over the next decade is over 6,700 students. And this is just projected enrollment. Um, this board in our community and later in February, we begin the updated student counts for 2017, which will look at our enrollment projections over the next decade. But right now, what we are projecting right now is that we'll have over 6,700 students enrolled in our school system in the next decade, which looks at our population really transitioning now from elementary to middle school and ultimately um, looking at high school as well. If you think about our special education population, we started this last year, where we didn't look at managing growth as just enrollment, we started looking at managing growth in terms of how do we support student populations in need. And so our five-year growth for students with disabilities has increased 7%. Well, right now we have over 14,282 students who are enrolled in our special education population. And if you think about it, the growing demographics really are students who are identified as autistic. So it's making sure we provide supports to those students um, who are our most vulnerable students, but also as those students transition from fifth to sixth grade and ultimately from seventh to eighth grade, with eighth to ninth grade, how do we provide those supports to those students but also uh, those families? 
but also our English learner population. And we just talked about the fact that we have over 5,000 English learners in our school system. That's grown over 37% in the last five years. And with that, we have students at various levels where they may attend our schools and they've not had any um, formal English instruction. They may have had some, um, but we have to make sure that regardless of the level they're coming at, that we're providing the appropriate support, with Spanish being the predominant language with over 55% of the students who are English learners identified as speaking Spanish. So with that, we propose a fiscal year operating budget with a couple things to keep in mind. I mean, we say this a lot, but we have, as a school system, no authority to tax, bond, or issue debt. Uh, we are going on the, uh, on the anticipation that state aid to education is fully funded. And for the third consecutive year, we will be working directly with our county counterparts to request funding above maintenance of effort, again, for the third consecutive year. We're not looking at changing our budget priorities. We're sticking with our, our very similar budget priorities that this board has seen in prior years, which looks at managing the growth of our school system, raising the bar and closing gaps within our school system, and most importantly, investing in the future of our school system and of our county. So if we take budget principle number one in terms of managing growth, we know right now we're going to have over 1,100 additional students in Baltimore County for next school year. So we're proposing that we have nearly 70 new positions that support classroom growth within our school system. We also look at the fact that we want to look at schools which have larger special education populations growing on what we did last year, uh, where we look at adding additional 15 teachers that will support a special education population. And in addition, adding 17 um, ESOL teachers who will support our students who are English learners within our school system. This also will look to support the work that we're doing at Owings Mills High School, where we've looked at a newcomer center for students who are transitioning to Owings Mills as a ninth grade, and how we support those students, not just in the classroom, but with social worker support, but also parent coordinator support as well. As you know, we have a, a pretty uh, a robust capital plan going on right now with Schools for Our Future, and so we will be opening three new schools and opening a new addition at Padonia Elementary School. So this budget will look at increasing the staffing in order to be able to support that. Particularly, also, we'll be opening a new Northeast Elementary School in August of 2018, which we always allocate hiring the principal a year in advance to work with us through the boundary process, and also making sure we work with our community, since we'll be bringing, at that point, um, several elementary schools into that boundary uh, conversation. We also have looked at managing growth a little bit differently this year, where we've also brought in our transportation, our facilities, and our maintenance departments as well. And this board has been very direct that they want us to focus on the operational support and the transportation support for our school system. Because if you think about over the last 10 years, we've added over 1 million square footage to our buildings, which is an increase of 6%. But we've not necessarily kept pace with the operational support positions in order to do that. And so we are, with this budget, asking for additional maintenance, custodial, but also project management support that will look at not just new construction projects we have, but also the additional square footage that Mr. Dixon and his team has to support with custodial maintenance services, being able to look at getting those ratios down for our custodial and maintenance support staff. We've also been able to work with David McCray, our Director of Transportation, in terms of how we provide additional transportation support, particularly in the area of customer service. So when parents and community members call, they have concerns around our buses um, and our bus uh, transportation department, that we can respond in a timely manner to them. But we also have sufficient routes on our roads, but also the number of drivers to be able to be able to support those routes. And so we are asking this budget to look at automatic vehicle tracking, which will allow us to look at every single vehicle that Baltimore County owns to determine where that vehicle is and so we can actually have better routing as we've in integrated our electronic routing system as well, too. If we look at budget principle number two, raising the bar and closing gaps within our school system, it's important to know that we still continue to transition to new standards within the state of Maryland. Um, in addition, we are next going to be moving towards science with the next generation science standards that will look at students at elementary, middle, and high school looking at an integrated approach to science as opposed to high school where you would take one test being just biology. You'll be taking an integrated science test that will have biology, earth science, and chemistry all in one, all in one test. And so we've been working directly with our teachers to make sure that we allocate an additional $7 million to our budget to give them additional instructional supports and resources to be able to do the work that we're asking to do in classrooms every single day. As stated earlier, we have over 57 or 4,700 students participating in our passport program that's right now at 40 schools within our school system. We want to be able to expand that work. And so we're going to be proposing six additional FTEs to allow us to continue that work, not just in fourth grade, but also in fifth grade as those students transition and have more time with their teacher as well. 
we're asking for an additional nearly $1 million to support our magnet programs. And I think folks would agree that we have a, a pretty robust magnet offerings in Baltimore County. But this will particularly go to two special programs. We're looking at the elementary level, looking at our students learning coding. And so right now, students at Cromwell Valley Elementary School and Chatsworth School are working on coding as early as kindergarten. Um, and so we want to continue that work, expand it so that we can then ultimately move it into the middle school and the high school. And this budget will actually allow us to be able to do that. In addition, as we go through the renovation of Whitlawn High School, we've been partnering over the last year with the Community College of Baltimore County to allow our students to earn an associate's degree and a high school diploma at the same time with the Early College High School program at Whitlawn High School. And so this budget will allow us to support the first class of students who will be coming in in August of 2017. And working with the GTCAC, uh, we've been able to work to make sure that as we look at our home and hospital opportunities for students, that our advanced academic learners are not necessarily left out as well too. And so this budget will look at adding additional positions so that we can offer the full array of courses that we offer during the school day for home and hospital for our advanced academic learners as well. And last but not least, as we look at our math growth, we want to make sure the students, particularly who are going from fifth to sixth grade and eighth to ninth grade, have supports. And so we're asking for dollars to actually allow us to have a math academy, particularly during the summer, for students as they transition from middle school to high school and ultimately from elementary to middle school as well. Last but not least, the biggest part of the budget request, of course, is investing in our future. And so with over 19,000 full-time employees and roughly 21,000 employees total, the bulk of the budget request that we're putting forward is roughly $42.6 million in salaries and benefits. This will allow all of our employees to get a 2% cost of living adjustment, but also as we've negotiated pay steps for individuals where as appropriate, they would get those as well too. So again, investing in our future really looks at, for the most part, $42.6 million to actually invest in the future for our workforce. In addition to investing in the future, we have seen um, STAT in action. We have seen some great things happen with our students. We continue to monitor um, STAT. Our curriculum committee gets um, updates on STAT, and our full board gets a full update on the program as well, too, and that comes to the board at the end of the year. However, our curriculum committee does get that report mid-year when we work with Johns Hopkins. And so right now, STAT is in every elementary school in grades one through five. It's in every middle school in grade six, and it's in seven middle school lighthouse schools in grades six and seven, in addition to three high schools, Owens Mills, Pikesville, and Chesapeake High School in grades 9 through 12. As promised to this board, we are looking at doing a two-year pilot for our high schools, and so this budget request of $4.5 million for STAT does not expand to any more high schools. We will still stay with just Owings Mills, Chesapeake, and at Pikesville High School, but this will allow us to move in all grades for all middle schools throughout our county. In addition to the technology infrastructure and support, we want to make sure that we have about $5.2 million that will look at additional servers, that will look at an expansion of BCPS1, but a $3.4 million request of that is for the upgrade of our financial and payroll system. In collaboration with the county, we've been having conversations around making sure we support with a newer system around that. And last but not least, the building maintenance support really looks at adding additional maintenance support staff. That's a roughly a half million dollars to make sure that we're able to cover the square footage and add additional positions as needed. So when you look at our proposed FY18 budget principles, we're not changing anything in terms of those principles. We're keeping it the same, where 75% of that request is investing in our future through our workforce. That roughly 8.6 million that request is, um, is 8.6 million is a 12% increase for managing growth and nearly a 13% increase for raising the bar and closing gaps. So when you look at all of our budget dollars for the general fund revenue, and I'll get to all of our budget dollars in a little bit, we're looking at a $1.5 billion proposed budget for our general fund, with roughly $64 million additional coming from the county. Even though you, you saw me, and I want to make sure that I point this out, we did talk about the state budget request being fully funded, and it is. You look at a decrease on screen because there is a one-time $2.2 million pension supplement that we're getting in this year's budget, that even though it's fully funded for next year, that one-time payment it would not be there. But we are anticipating that be fully funded for state education um, for Baltimore County. And then we start looking at the total funds for all of our budgets, and I'll walk through this um, just a little bit. Again, the $1.5 billion for our general fund. Our special revenue fund are mostly our title dollars with special education and with our Title I program. Our internal service fund is really our making sure that we uh, self-insure ourselves with worker compensation. Capital projects budget, we have invested, and I should say our county's invested record numbers of dollars in terms of school construction. Our debt service fund is paying the debt, even though we have no authority to tax, bond, or issue debt, we carry the debt service on our books. And last but not least, our food nutrition services fund is our enterprise fund, which is a self-supporting operation within our school system. All of our funds together looks at roughly a $1.98 billion budget for fiscal year 2018. 
This just begins the process for this budget with the board. Uh, key date, of course, is tonight, me presenting the operating budget request to the board. Um, I know that we will have several um, meetings in terms of work sessions and public hearings. I'm just presenting the information for the board's review tonight. We will have a public hearing next Tuesday night in this room at 630 um, for the public. Um, if it snows, and we're hoping it's no snow, if it snows that there's a revision to that date, which will happen the next day. The board has voted to have two work sessions, one being January 24th and one being January 31st. Um, and again, if there's snow, there are alternate dates for both of those. However, the Feb February 7th is when we're asking the board to approve this budget so that we can get it over to the county immediately thereafter for the county executive to have an inclusion in his proposed FY18 budget for Baltimore County. And Mr. Chair, with that, that presents my proposed operating budget for FY18. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Uh, my fellow board members are invited to review the budget and to submit their questions uh, directly to their superintendent, who will promptly respond to those questions. Uh, if you'll do so by January 17, uh, then we can continue to move on that schedule. As Dr. Dance said, a public hearing uh, will be held next Tuesday, the 17th at 6.30, uh, right here. And uh, interested persons may sign up to speak uh, beginning at 5.30. Um, and as he also said, uh, board work session uh, on the 24th at 6.30 and again on the 31st, that one at 5.30. Uh, with that, I'll move to the next item on our agenda, which have, is... Mr. Chairman, do we have an yes, opportunity for some questions? No, the, as a matter of fact, this was just almost the equivalent of a first reader. Uh, the, uh, the operating budget uh, is presented. Um, there will be uh, work sessions for us on that, and there can be written questions or questions directed to the superintendent between now and that work session. May I ask a question of you? You may. Okay. Um, and I might be remembering incorrectly, but it seems to me that this time, by this time last year, we had held those two by two sessions that we have with the central office staff to uh, ask questions and familiarize ourselves with the budget. When are those planned? I think that we can, uh, we can talk about having opportunity for you or others to uh, meet with uh, the uh, superintendent staff uh, between now and the 24th. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next on our agenda is uh, uh, item O, and that is an opportunity for public comment on policies. Uh, we have, I believe, five policies uh, for which uh, there's opportunity to speak. The first one is uh, policy 3150, non-instructional services, um, and uh, Bosch Ferrone has signed up. So, Dr. Ferrone, there's only one person who has signed up, and that's you. <laughs> you, may, you may pass. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Mrs. Causey. Uh, before he comes up to speak, when I printed out my board doc documents, it actually printed out uh, Board of Education Policy 3170 again. So I'm curious, and I had sent an email about that, so I'm curious whether this is the correct mm -hmm. policy that our stakeholders should be commenting on, or do we need to actually get policy 3150 correctly into board docs. Okay, well, the, uh, it, is, uh, it is 3150 that we're speaking uh, to tonight, which is non-instructional services, right, Ms. Decker? That's how I'm doing it. It doesn't print out the detail. Print it out 3170. Right, that's what Ms. Causey said. Uh, I have a copy here. 3170. All right. Dr. Ferone. Uh, policy 3150. Yes, sir. Where is it? 3150. It's not there. It's 3170. 31. There. Well, 3150, obviously, you can see the real policy if you just go to the policy section. But uh, Mr. Chairman, I have 3170. Hold on one second. We're gonna we're gonna reset the clock. Sorry. Oh. It says thirty one seventy. Right. Should it be? Okay. It should be. Um, the one in my hard copy is thirty one seventy. Yes. Right. So it should be corrected. Should it be thirty one fifty? Fifty. All right. So anyway, it is thirty one fifty. 
want me to give this to him? No, I don't think, I think Dr. Ferone would like to have seen it before this very moment. Um, but it's 3150 that's on the agenda. Um, do you have uh, okay, desire no to comment on non-instructional services? Yeah. Very good. Well, don't, don't move because the next item uh, for public speaker is policy 6600, uh, instruction educational options. And you are the first of two speakers. Oh, you know what? I've one, taken one that. I've taken that out of order, haven't I? It should be 30, 32, 25, 25 non-instructional right. services. Three, two, two, five. Sorry about that. Okay. You've also signed up for that, though, Dr. Frum. Um. Policy thirty-two twenty-five. Yes, sir. I think it's a very good policy. However, and bear with me a little bit. Um, when we, as a school system, buy furniture, air conditioner, renovate, build a new school, what comes to my mind is value. So. Um, if we buy a carrier air conditioner versus a generic brand name, um, the price is different. What counts is the relation of the quality and effectiveness, efficiency of that equipment into the price. So I wonder if the board would consider, would consider something in the form of adding to standards under A uh, that would relate to the value. Um, I don't know how to phrase it, and I hope I'm kind of expressing myself clearly. Um, uh, others in, on the board, Ms. Cozy, for instance, and others in, in behind me have stressed about using our funds wisely. And I think a value when we purchase something or build something would be important principle to take in consideration. And I just don't see that word or uh, that thought in that paragraph. Um, and obviously, the analysis of that value would be an objective based on objective measures. That's all what I have about policy 3225. Very good. You were the only speaker on that um, issue. The next one is policy 6600, instruction educational options, and you are the first speaker on that one. All right. I have one comment on, on this policy. Uh, item number one, policy statement. The Board of Education of Baltimore County is committed to providing students with equitable access to opportunities for effective teaching and learning. My thought that this paragraph, that small sentence, would be stronger if we say the Board of Education of Baltimore County is committed to providing all students with equitable access, adding the word all students. Uh, I know you as a board, oftentimes you talk about that in so many different ways. By adding it here, I think it will give more value and more clarity uh, that to the subject that we are talking about. That's all what I have, about 6,600. Okay, if you'll just stay at the table there, I'll invite Marion Moore to come forward. She's also signed up to speak on 6,600. Okay. All right, I'm not as prepared, but I will do the best that I can. Okay, so for 6,600, a few things I'm gonna point out in the standards. I'm gonna to jump to B, then I'll go back to A. It says educational options programs shall, shall follow the board's curriculum standards course requirements. Uh, 
dot, 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 and all policies and rules concerning promotion, retention, attendance, and behavior. <clears throat> With the implementation of this particular policy, it's important that, and I haven't seen this lately, um, in about, in 2012, there were, were a lot of publications about the P2, P21 skills. I felt that this structure and framework was perfect for secondary schools. This is when the core subjects such as math, science, social studies, uh, language arts, and themes were used interchangeably in order for a student to receive the information um, in a way that they can apply it to their life and careers. So for example, if we have uh, math, language arts, and blend that with entrepreneurship and business, because when I taught business education, I literally had to be exposed to all of the core subjects. Well, my, my students, they had to write. That's language arts. They had to, they had to you know, write their business plans. There was a, fin a financial section of the business plan. So they applied their academic core subject math. Uh, marketing, presentation skills, when they had to actually present. So all of those can raise the bar for students in summer school or uh, taking evening classes, because obviously they weren't engaged when they were in class in the first place, or they wouldn't be in summer school or taking a class on, on, on a Saturday and recovering credits. Something was wrong in terms of the implementation of uh, the actual content. The delivery wasn't uh, engaging in terms of maybe using technology. I would suggest Survey the students and find out who your strong teachers are in those core subjects. Pay your teachers extra money to do video presentations so that they can have other options besides the person that's um, in implementing or facilitating the summer school and evening classes. You see what I'm saying? Because they need to have a diverse implementation of the content uh, because every teacher is not engaging. I mean, let's just be honest. And um, please include uh, CTE in this, where we're blending career technology education with the course subjects uh, that the kids will be taking uh, for the course. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our next um, is the proposed deletion of policy 6601. Uh, Dr. Ferron. Um, Mr. Chairman, board members, I'm just here to compliment the PRC on this policy. I don't have any any additions or or criticism. Very good. Um, and uh, the last of the uh, policies for public comment tonight is the proposed deletion of policy 6604. And Dr. Ferron, you signed up for that as well. This one, reading it, sounds good to me but I noticed that it is for deletion. So I just want to echo, echo what Lily was saying about deletion of policies. Honestly, I can't truly comprehend why it's being deleted. There must be a good reason, and I missed it. And I take this opportunity to ask the board members always to project their, their voice and to speak into the microphone, because I'm truly, truly missing some of the things that are important to know, and this might be one. So. Um, uh, I, I don't have any any uh, any objection for deletion, but I just don't understand why. Very good, uh, Ms. Moore. You had also signed up to speak on the deletion of 6604. You don't have anything else to say. Very good. Very good. Uh, so that is uh, the uh, uh, concludes item O on our agenda. Next on our Chairman? Mrs. Miller. Could we? Um bring back policy 3150 next time since um, that document was not available for the I'll public? Ask, I'll ask PRC to... to I, I see no reason why we sh cannot do that, and I recommend we do that as well. Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, next um, on our agenda is board committee updates. Um, and who wishes to begin? I'll begin. It's simple. Uh, the audit committee uh, is meeting tomorrow afternoon, so at the next meeting we'll have an update. Very good. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, who else has a uh, committee update? Ms. Johnson. Yep, so at the last curriculum committee meeting, uh, we received an update on the magnet application process, particularly at the middle school level. We were able to discuss scheduling and budgeting for the Sheltered Instructional Observation Protocol, or SIOP. And we, got, we received an update on work that the Grading and Reporting Committee has, has worked on. Um, for everybody's information, the committee has 52 people on the committee. Um, there are representatives from the advisory councils, such as GTCAC. There's area and student advisory councils. There are principals, teachers, central area staff, um, and additionally, um, we are still asking, or the county is still asking for input from, from anybody. If you want to go online to BCPS, to the Magnet um, site, and you can give your additional thoughts, inputs, requests, those sort of things. So the, the input is still ongoing. The next curriculum committee meeting is uh, January 19th at 4.30 <coughs> p.m. in the administrative building. Ms. Williams, PRC. Yes, the next uh, PRC committee meeting will be held on February 13th at 5.30 p.m. Um, just want to remind the public it is open to the public and our agenda will be posted on the school system's website prior to the meeting. I also want to thank um, the public for their uh, comments tonight. Um, and one of the things that, um, assuming I'm reappointed to PRC, one of the things that um, I want to make sure we, we do a better job uh, at is revisiting uh, policies once we've had um, public comment. Very good. Ms. Miller, technology? Yes, thank you. I've requested quite a bit of information from the SIT committee staff, and I'm hoping to receive soon recommendations from them on how best to collect information on the time our students spend on their devices during the school day. Um, also, Mr. Gillis suggested we bring up as a topic the recent breach of student data that affected 1,000 uh, Frederick County student records, and I thank him for that suggestion. I'm asking that the board consider a motion to conduct an audit of BCPS student data records to ensure that they do not contain social security numbers. And our next SIT committee meeting is February 15th. Great, I think that uh, is the full complement of committees uh, because building and contracts was just today. Thank you. Oh. Next on our agenda is um, board member comments, item Q on our agenda, and I'll begin with Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, I'll make mine quick. I just want to congratulate and commend Delaney High School's marching band for a stellar performance at this year's Sugar Bowl. They participated in the parade and the halftime show. I was fortunate enough to be able to attend in New Orleans. Great time and no logistical small feat to get that many kids down there. So kudos to the students and teachers. Great job, Delaney. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Ms. Miller. Thank you. Uh, two quick items. Um, I'm, I'm asking for input on the proposed operating budget from stakeholders and particularly from professional budget analysts who might be willing to assist me in understanding the budget. So if you have that kind of expertise, I would love to hear from you. Uh, the other item is um, I had requested uh, an agenda item for tonight, the audit of student data records for social security numbers. Um, news articles in December informed us that there was a breach of student data prior to 2010 that affected 1,000 Frederick County Public School students. It included the compromise of names, dates of birth, and social security numbers. Um, it's unknown whether that data was breached on the county or state level. It occurred at an unspecified time prior to 2010, but the breach was not made public until six plus years later. And as of last month, this student data was posted online being offered for sale. All county school systems should be taking proactive measures to protect our student data and requesting the same of the state level. It will be prudent to conduct an audit of BCPS data to ensure that student social security numbers, which are no longer collected, have all been removed from the system. Uh, for example, two years ago, I reviewed three of my, my children's school files and found that one still had the social security number in it. 
So just because they're no longer collecting them does not mean the ones already collected have been removed. Um, if BCPS will at least audit its own records for Social Security numbers, we can eliminate the possibility of our student SSNs being compromised in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple times this evening that the legislative session has started in Annapolis, and I just wanted to mention that uh, I've had the opportunity, along with other MABE members, to um, meet with some of our legislators and encourage them to support things that help education, um, particularly in Baltimore County, but across the state, uh, which includes uh, increased state funding for school construction and renovation, which we certainly need, and full state funding for a lot of educational efforts um, and then also things like pre-k and things that will enhance the academic experience of our students we're promoting down in Annapolis as the session begins thank you Mr. McDaniels. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to express uh, my congratulations to the Maryland Youth Art Flag Contest winner, uh, Wendy Portillo of our Parkville High School, and of course, congratulations to her uh, teacher, James Hester. A uh, special note of recognition to our Perry Hall Middle School, sixth grade orchestra and choral students. I went to the winter concert. It was a fantastic concert. And our own Julie Hen's daughter was playing in the orchestra. She failed to share that with us. Uh, nonetheless, it was a wonderful performance, and if you get a chance to go in the spring, please come along. It's a real, it's a real fun time. I want to thank all the colleagues today that supported our capital budget. It's an extensive project. It'll do a project uh, or project-based budget. It'll do a lot of things for just for schools in our sixth district. You've heard me say them before. I won't list all of them, but the Kenwoods, the Stemmers Runs, the Victory Villas. The list goes on and on. Orms Elementary School, where in fact I was just yesterday. There was a heating problem. There, I met Kevin Smith there, and before we got there, the heating problem was fixed. Um, that's not to say that tomorrow, with expansion and contraction, there won't be something else someplace else. But uh, very commendable that folks responded so so quickly. I was also at our Crossroads Center. I uh, always stop and say hello to the bus drivers. One of our bus drivers, Mr. Shanks, he drives for us. Uh, he spent 30 years as a Baltimore City police officer. He says this is one of the best jobs one can have is driving. Um, Victoryville Elementary School Community Boundary Study. Uh, you heard mention made of the $100,000 that this board generously and rightfully approved for that project at our last meeting. Well, that project's to build a new 700-seat school, and the boundary study starts tomorrow. And it'll be, I want to say, at uh, 6 o'clock, 6 to 7.30, in the Middle River Middle School uh, cafeteria. And I note, Middle River Middle School is another one of our schools that will be air conditioned because of the munificence of our county executive, our county council, and our state uh, uh, elected officials. Um, thank you so much. Thanks. Next is our student member, Ms. Blatt. Um, I've already shared all my thoughts. Very in my good. <laughs> Ms. Johnson. Um, thank you. So I see one of my many roles here on the school board as a champion for public education, all, ge all education in general, but public education. So many of us um, have assumed roles by our choice or by what the public has kind of thrust upon us. Um, but either way, as a champion and not a cheerleader, um, I hear plenty of criticisms and critiques and, and suggestions of things that we can do throughout the county. And many of these criticisms and critiques have been, um, have been acted on, and some we, we are still working on some of these. But more often than that, I hear, I receive phone calls, I receive emails um, from parents, students, and community members on on what inspirational things we're doing throughout the county. Uh, teachers in, uh, specifically like to share some of these positive things that are going, out, going on throughout the county, in their schools, in their classrooms. So I decided to start sharing these things as my board comments. So tonight, I'm going to shout out one particular school and one particular teacher. And however, I am aware that there are countless teachers who are dedicated and driven. Um, and some of these stories will articulate how BCPS teachers have adapted to the changes in technology, culture, and the student body as a whole. So as I mentioned in the past, possibly to nauseam, at nauseam to some of you, I have four children, and um, all of them are actually in lighthouse schools. They range from age 7 to 17. And uh, one of my students, or one of my children, started telling me about wind turbines. She shared with me that she had done some research online about these energy-saving devices. 
and um, she told me that Ms. Levine, her teacher, um, had instructed them to do some research on author bias. She discovered that there had been author bias in the script and the videos that they were reading and watching on these wind turbines. So she found that they were, uh, on, the, on the negative side, that they were, exce quote, excessively noisy causing sound pollution. They had the potential to cause severe migraines and are, in fact, not as effective as manufacturers had described. During her research, she was asked to use her tablet to go online and find images, videos, and articles about these turbines. Uh, she was also asked to read articles out of a magazine and, um, and books that she held in her hand. And then she had the choice to write a PowerPoint presentation or a bulleted handwritten presentation to share her findings with the class. And then after everybody had their findings, they were going to distribute those and discuss, have an open discussion about the pros and cons of these wind turbines. Um, and so all of this wind turbine author bias was done by an eight-year-old in a standard level third grade class. So I was, um, when her, my daughter shared this with, with uh, my husband and I and her 17 and 13-year-old brother and sister, they thought it was freaking amazing that she was talking about author bias and wind turbines and pros and cons and had the option to write a PowerPoint presentation or a handwritten bulleted point um, uh, presentation. So yes, I guess I'm showing a little bit of author bias here because I thought it was that amazing. But I just, I share this because I look forward to what else she and my other children, the other 112,000 students in Baltimore County Public Schools have to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Yulfelder. Yes, I'd like to talk for a minute about uh, the importance and the correlation between uh, the uh, economic status of our county and the educational system. I am privileged to uh, be on a committee called the Economic Advisory Committee of Baltimore County, and we are advisors to the county council. And uh, Many times during the probably eight years I've been on this committee, I have emphasized how important it is to maintain the educational standard and the high value of education that we have in Baltimore County. This is supported by uh, the fact that several years ago, upon the base relocation out of New Jersey, uh, we had countless people coming down from New Jersey who came to the school board headquarters to look at the status of schools where they may want to relocate here in Baltimore County. Um, so again, education, the, the, the schools that are in our county are really primary to where people are going to move. Now let me back up for a second and tell you the importance of residents. Uh, the county relies on primarily the taxes created, uh, the property taxes. But there's also all the income taxes and other things uh, that uh, the county relies on in their total budget. And it's been told to me that one residence supports more taxes than any other single uh, thing that the county collects. Uh, during our economic uh, advisory meeting, uh, the chairperson uh, was quick to tell us that the 23, 24, and 25-year-olds, that portion of our population is the greatest portion that exists right now. And that in 10 years, they probably will want to relocate. Right now, we are losing residents to Howard County. Um, and, and that's right, basically because of the fact that, that they are promoting uh, education, perhaps to a greater degree than us. But so the importance of education and the economic status of our county is, is synonymous. And so I believe that we have to continue to support education. Uh, our budget uh, is an example of what we have to do. And, and not getting into the inside of the budget, but the fact that the fact of the matter is that if the county executive goes forward with our requests, uh, the chances are that the county council will approve it. Now, this tells me one thing. We, we've got to always have an executive staff in our county that supports education. And I think that's our responsibility to keep promoting education because of the economics of the county. And this is in years to come, but we have to do right now what is necessary to create the situation or the, the atmosphere that education is primary to the economic wealth and the economic status of our county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yulfutter. Mrs. Causey. 
Thank you very much. And I appreciate Mr. Ufelder's comments about the connection between education and the health of our county financially. It's also uh, education can be the foundation of communities. So not only is that financial piece so important, but also the community piece, where our schools, whether they're the elementary school, the middle school, or the high school, can be the foundation for communities, the building blocks uh, that help families and businesses thrive in areas. And uh, that's another reason that we need to look around the county and make things work for every student and every family in every location in our county. Um, I would just like to say, uh, a few things. I hope that uh, over the holiday break that all had a chance for renewal. I also want to say that now that winter's here and tough decisions will be coming around the weather and student and staff safety that I did want to give a shout out and a thank you to Kevin Smith and staff and the superintendent for making a two hour delay last week for the Hereford zone. As you know, it's 200 square miles uh, that get the kids to the feeder schools and the one high school. So it's a lot of ground to cover and most of it stays icy in the valleys and the hilly areas. So we appreciate that. Um, next, I do want to say that it was great to be at the Tabco legislative breakfast. And I will just show their poster that was their um, motto for the meeting. I would just like to add nurses are a piece of it because I talked to two of them afterwards who told me that that was a good idea to add them and it was. And I want, really appreciate uh, Ms. Baton working on behalf of the teachers and also um, the, um, the support staff. Um, and it's very important that the board, even those members that weren't there, that we listen to our stakeholders um, and our very important um, advisory people, including Ms. Baton and also uh, Mr. Lawrence, who was here earlier. And I do appreciate the community members and also the advisory council folks that do come and give your comments because they are very helpful to us. So please keep it up. Um, I would also like to say that the um, board needs to carefully evaluate the budget since we just received it um, and we haven't yet discussed it as a board. Um, also for the stakeholders, uh, the groups, uh, if they can evaluate it for the budget requests that they made at the council meetings that they held, uh, and then let us know, um, maybe even by email in advance of the public comment, um, how they feel that the budget is supporting their requests. Um, and again, I will ask, I did this at the last board member comments, um, and I appreciate Ms. Johnson giving a brief um, update on the curriculum, but you know, we heard from our advisory council folks tonight that there is still really serious concern from the teacher side and the student side and the parent side about the grading and reporting procedures. We have not received uh, in high school which schools are using which grading scales. There's only 24. So surely uh, staff should be looking at that and they should be able to provide that information to us. Also disaggregating the data for quarter one and now we have quarter two coming up, uh, coming to a close rather, um, especially related to our special population, special needs, LLL. How is this grading reporting affecting those students? Also, it's been brought up multiple times about uh, perhaps receiving a letter from Baltimore County Public School Schools to colleges about the grading changes for our high school students who are applying to colleges, but also we have students applying to technical programs that they hope to get into after school. And uh, the, this grading and reporting we've heard is affecting the students' grades um, adversely, and, and it would be good to get an update and is that a discussion the board needs to have to make a recommendation or is that uh, something that can be handled at the committee level? Also in our building and contracts committee meeting, uh, we were running tight on time and so we ran out of time for me to discuss this, but it ties into the budget because it's very important that when the board makes decisions uh, and votes on contracts and on programs, uh, Blueprint 2.0 and other things, that we can feel confident that what we vote on is number one, that we've made a good decision, but number two, that it is then followed up on by uh, the superintendent and the staff. And it has come to my attention recently that uh, there is one major contract that somehow that has gone awry and I'm gonna be asking the chair more formally in an email for specific information to be presented to us at the next meeting because as we're evaluating this very, very large budget, um, and all of these important programs uh, to improve the education for our students, we really need to be able to know that decisions are gonna be followed through on. So it's come to my attention that uh, we had voted on a contract for interactive classroom 
and uh, February 2nd, 2016, for $41 million. And there was uh, about an hour of discussion at that board meeting, and folks can go back online to board docs and look it up. The, the uh, discussion of that starts at approximately the second hour and 40 minutes. It was quite a long meeting. And at that meeting, there was a motion made that was approved unanimously that the RFP for the interactive classroom should be go back out to bid and come back to the board and that they would separate out the sound management system and that um, they do it for a one-year contract. And what has happened is that has not come back to the board for approval, uh, but there is a, there are, uh, a requirement for for schools to choose from one of two choices in a new interactive classroom setup um, that is the approved uh, equipment. But in fact, the board has not approved what would be the new equipment. So, uh, you know, and issues that came up in that discussion. Uh, were brought up by several other members. Um, Mr. Virch had comments that the four-year leases do not just, in, in fact, tie us to four years, but that last year then ties us to eight years. So are these classroom uh, systems, are they engaged in leases? Is it a purchase? I have no idea. That was a $41 million contract brought before the board, and it never came back to us. So I'd really like to understand who was responsible for that decision and how did that happen and bring it back to the board for discussion to find out if that is in fact the equipment that the board feels is the best use of the taxpayers dollars um, there were uh, statements about I think we should rebid it I don't think we're gonna have troubles legally it was contingent on this board approving it um, Ms. Johnson was questioning why the end date was going out to 2025 Mr. Senator Collins at the time said that he was not gonna vote for it and that he uh, supported my motion. And in fact, it was a unanimous vote by the, by the board. Um, and also, uh, Mr. Gillis had comments supporting sending it back and then bringing it back to the board for approval. So it was not done. And it, one of the major uh, factors of, of the concern of the board was that the staff had put forward a system using um, box light short throw projections as opposed to the Epson system that had been used most recently, and that in fact was less expensive, that had uh, more industry uh, reliability and so forth. So this is a very, very big concern. Um, in addition to the uh, ability of students and teachers to use the, the, the system. Now, one of the things that, I, as I was looking at this just recently, there is a policy, policy 3215, and I'm gonna ask, uh, you know, formally in an email for our chair to con of the Policy Review Committee to bring that forward to review. Um, and in it, it states that the, um, in the guidelines, contracts or contract modifications in excess of $500,000 shall be executed by the board chair and the superintendent. This was a $41 million contract, supposedly over four, four years, which would average out to $10 million a year. So this is a significant dollar amount. Then guideline number uh, 2B says contracts or contract modifications of $500,000 or less may be executed by the superintendent or his designee. And one of the other things I'm gonna be formally asking for is was there a contract uh, entered into by the system for these projectors that were not approved by the board in some increments less than that $500,000 um, amount. Um, it would be very, very concerning. It is concerning that this is going on and the Board of Education um, needs to find out what is happening. And as I said, I'm going to formally request of the chair um, information about it. And I would hope that he would facilitate my request for information on this issue. Um, with that said, I really do hope that we can work um, collaboratively as a community and as a board to work on this budget. Uh, to make the best use of taxpayer dollars for our students. Thank you. Mrs. Williams. 
Thank you. Um, I do want to just share with my colleague that the request um, concerning policy 3215 would need to come to PRSC um, by request of the entire board. So I would just want to make sure you're aware of that, that the request would not come directly to the PRSC chair. So should that I make a motion? Properly. Um, I, that's your decision. But I just wanted to let you know that's not the proper procedure that you shared. Um, okay, my next I'll, comment. I'll take that up with the chair of the board at another time. Thank okay. you for that. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> My next comment is um, I was happy to be able to attend the TAPCO um, legislative uh, breakfast on Saturday. Um, I use that as one, um, one of the ways to um, listen to s teachers, staff, and other staff um, persons um, concerning what they want um, to share with me about whatever is going on in Baltimore County school system. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Dance for um, his presentation of the operating budget. But I want to share with him and this board um, that it seems that whenever I'm in that forum, inevitably, it's always persons from the counseling staff who come up to me and who say, we still need more counselors. And I'm really hoping that that does not fall on deaf ears. And that's why I'm sharing it tonight, because I really believe, particularly in middle school and high school, we really need more counselors for our kids. Um, the last thing I, I want to say concerns the grading policy. I was a little alarmed tonight, although I don't know the extent of the situation, but I was alarmed to hear that some principals did not follow the addendum because if, if there was a directive from the superintendent, and if our principals are not following that, I'm concerned about that. And um, I would hope that that's uh, followed up to make sure that's not happening on a routine basis. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Eaton. As you know, I voted to pass the capital budget, but I did it with some hesitation. I hope that in the future that the board's questions can be answered before we have to vote on anything like this again. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. So I'll echo that. I also want to um, share a note regarding uh, Ms. Miller and your comments in uh, connection to data security. I agree with them. I think that it's um, an issue of the day. I'm not sure I agree entirely with the audit. Uh, of all of our student data in its entirety, but I think it'd be prudent to take time to reassess uh, the security of our data and stay attuned uh, as it relates to that dispute between Frederick County Public Schools and the state. As we know, Frederick County is withholding data out of concerns uh, for its security, and so I th think we need to pay attention to what the result of that is. Finally, and quickly, uh, last year, the legislature passed a bill known as the Orange Ribbon for Healthy School Hours Law to encourage local school systems to, at the very least, begin the process of studying school start times. Uh, I encourage this board to take the small and first step on this critical issue of setting up such a study. Uh, we should better understand the effect of our current schedule on our kids and the feasibility to do something about it. It's just a study. It's going to take some time. We should start it now. It's a small step. Let's do it. Thank you all very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is an information item, and you'll see in your materials the uh, revised superintendent's rule. Um, and then several announcements. Uh, schools close three hours early uh, this Friday, uh, grade reporting and data analysis. So Mr. Virch, you get off early. Uh, even more importantly, uh, schools are closed to observe Martin Luther King's uh, birthday on Monday. Uh, we've already heard several times tonight there is a uh, operating budget public hearing on the 17th. Uh, the next board meeting on, is on the 24th. And we have uh, yet another public work session on the budget on the 31st. And finally, I'll remind the board members when you go over to uh, sign the order, uh, Ms. Decker has a uh, package for you. Um, we are adjourned. Thank you.